shared some really great information, kind of set the stage as to why this work is really important. And, and you know, I think we're all, all in agreement as to why more research needs to happen. And um, I think this morning just kind of um, shed a little more light onto what's actually happening in practice um, for to, to uh, support our, our thoughts too. So, um, Whitney and I are just going to share a little bit about um, the work that HFA has done and is currently doing um, for women with bleeding disorders and kind of how we got to this point today. Um, so, so we had this slide earlier too, but we kind of moved past it. But our just to share our mission and vision for anybody who's not super familiar with HFA. Um, our mission is, uh, well, we are a national nonprofit organization. We assist, educate, and advocate for the bleeding disorder community. Um, and our vision is to improve the care and quality of life for all people with bleeding disorders by removing barriers to diagnosis, treatment, and care. Um, so this is, do you want to just, I don't know where we can put it. Maybe the zoom thing. Let me just right here. Yeah. It's going to be a problem. Yeah. Really. OK, so we wanted to talk about some of our past work with women, as Janet said. Um, and this is just a list of some of the things that we've done in the in the past recent years. Um, so we have the Blood Sisterhood, um, which is kind of the the companion to the Blood Brotherhood, who's here right now. Um, Sister Space, which is a monthly chat um, for uh, for women. Um, and I actually looked up. I think I think our current nomenclature is females and non-binary people. So. Um, and then we have local education as well as national education for women, um, webinars, and then of course symposium. Uh, we like to do a lot of education there. We also have a toolkit for women online. Um, and then we have modules on learning central, learning central, excuse me. Um, we have lots of educational content on learning central, but we actually have a module specific to women, which is um, pretty unique. And we highly recommend it if you haven't had a chance to check it out, please do. Um, and then we also have a cooperative agreement with the CDC. Um, it's ongoing right now. Right now we're in our Project ECHO um, series and we're about to do our fourth session, um, second Tuesday of, what month is it? November. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Um, and and the, the goal of that one is actually to educate providers of women and specifically OBGYNs about some of the signs and symptoms um, that women see to try to um, get women diagnosed and uh, and treated earlier, sooner than than we have seen. Um, and then we also have in the works a project for a story collection to collect stories of women with bleeding disorders. Um, that is to come. <coughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. So, yep. <laughs> um, kind of how it all got started. Um, we applied for and received an award from Sapori, um, which is the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, um, which Lavelle, who kind of snuck in late, um, <laughs> works for. Um, she's a former uh, HFA employee and now um, working for Sapori. Uh, but we applied for this award um, for our Pride project. Um, it's the Patient Centered Research for Innovation, Development, and Education. And our goal with this award was really to start the conversation and educate the community about patient centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. Um, what we learned from doing this project, it was a two year project, um, was that, it, well, it kind of cemented what we knew that you know, women were not engaging in research and there were clearly no opportunities for them to engage um, and participate in, in clinical trials. Um, they're just kind of immediately excluded. Um, this was back in 2017 when this um, project took place. Um, and despite having, you know, the lack of opportunities, they showed up and they wanted to learn and they were hungry to learn and they want to participate. We heard this over and over and over again, the majority of, of the community that, that we educated through this project um, were women. So we wanted to take it further, um, feeling like you know there was this huge need and opportunity 
um, we applied for another engagement award with Corey. Um, mm -hmm. In 2019, we were awarded that um, to, to begin work on that project, and that was the Females in Research Sharing and Translation, or our first project. Um, and we really were trying to understand, get a better understanding from women um, if how and if they were participating, if there were opportunities that we just weren't hearing of or aware of, and then what, the, and if not, um, what barriers they were encountering for participation, um, and what kinds of things, what needs they had to be able to participate. Um, we also signed and talked to um, providers and other community stakeholders mm -hmm. to find out if they had opportunities for women to participate and then kind of what their thoughts were about how um, and what it would take to get um, patients involved and women participating in research opportunities. Um, the second year of that award, um, we convened a community-based research network, um, which was made up of um, female patients and providers, clinicians, researchers, and we had a representative from another community organization. Um, and we met on a monthly basis. Um, the first part of our, our work with this group was to um, provide some education um, and get everybody sort of, even though they came in with different levels of experience and expertise <laughs> and, and knowledge in different areas, um, we, we wanted everybody to at least have um, a source and kind of be on a level playing field, at least knowing where everyone was coming in. So we provided education to the group um, through a, a workbook that we adapted from a, another um, project that Corey had funded, and then also utilized um, Corey has a really good online training program um, for research, and we utilized that as well um, and allowed our the, the participants of the CBRN to. Um, do some self-paced learning and we had some discussion around that um, before we came together in our first meeting. Um, as I said, we met five times. We originally had scheduled only for four meetings, but the group wanted to keep convening. <laughs> so we added a fifth um, meeting and um, through that work, we developed the research agenda that we were going to um, well, that we've already shared, but we're going to share and talk about um, a little bit later this afternoon. I'll talk a little bit about Wired. Um, so a few of the, the female patients in the room, our first contact with them was from Wired. So it's a really near and dear to my heart project. Um, so this actually came out of the first project. Part of the first project was uh, to provide education to women about bleeding disorders um, and specifically bleeding disorders in women. Um, and we had intended to do that as an in-person gathering, kind of like a camp. Um, and then 2020 happened, so that wasn't going to work. Uh, so we uh, got funding for another project <clears throat> to be able to move that to an online platform. So. We created Wired Academy, um, and this was completely online, and it was uh, based on uh, engagement, peer engagement, and then we also had peer mentors. Um, so it was a lot of peer work and, and women teaching women. Um, so I'm going out of order. We had 88 women uh, enroll in this. Um, the primary goal was to provide that education that I talked about, um, and then the long-term objective uh, same as first was to increase the female influence and engagement in research development, implementation, and dissemination. Um, so part of the content that we talked about, we talked about signs and symptoms in women, but then we also talked about um, the, the patient-centered outcomes research and the comparative effectiveness research, just trying to share that education with women so they could feel empowered to participate in research. Um, and then a selection of the women who completed the program were invited to come um, onto the CBRN, uh, which is what Janet just talked about, the community-based research network, um, and to help formulate this research agenda. So um, we empowered them, and then we asked them to help us <laughs> pull out those, those things. 
So that led us to where we are today. Um, thankfully, uh, Corey <laughs> saw the value in the work that we created um, and gave us a little bit more funding to um, to be here today to um, share the research agenda that we created. Um, you know, our hope again today is to really build consensus around this agenda and um, have it adopted by the community and you know, put the put the words and work into action um, and, and leave here with a really good solid plan for next steps and moving forward. Um, any questions about any of the, our work or how we got to where we are today? <laughs> so kind of the capstone um, from our first project, because we were mid-COVID, um, we had intended to um, share our work broadly at our um, symposium meeting, um, but we were unable to do that um, due to COVID. So we created a video um, that was our capstone for first that kind of um, was a summary of the project um, and involved some of the people that um, really helped shape this, this work in this project. So we're going to show you the video that, that we created to just give you a little bit of a better understanding of the work and how important the patient centeredness is in this work. <laughs> No, I never thought I was going to see the day where research was going to be done about women with hemophilia. I really feel like people are really listening and they're starting to move forward and not just sitting in one spot talking. Yeah. I, I had to do something. When I saw the opportunity, I was like, this is this is a great way to kind of start making those changes that we need. Mm -hmm. We have had a lot of opportunity to hear anecdotal evidence that told us that, you know, the, the women in our community were struggling um, with access to care, with access to medications, and even um, that clinicians in delivery care didn't have enough evidence to be able to make recommendations about care or to even um, provide the care that the women were seeking because the evidence wasn't necessarily out there to support uh, treatment plans. And so we, you know, based on hearing all of this evidence, we real, you know, all these anecdotes, we realized that um, we wanted to be able to collect some data in a systematic way and to be able to show that there was a need to create this this project where we worked with researchers and academic researchers to bring um, to light the issues that women with eating disorders are feeling. So we wrote a proposal for our first project, um, which stands for Females in Research Sharing and Translation. Um, and we were awarded that um, the opportunity to move forward with that project um, from the quarry as well. And really the goal um, that we came up with for that this project um, was to increase female influence and engagement um, in research development. So implementation, idea generation, um, all the way through to dissemination, um, which we're you know hoping will ultimately affect um, clinical care of women with eating disorders. We went out into the community first of all um, and did focus groups with women um, that have diagnosed bleeding disorders or women that were um, have bleeding symptoms um, who may be yet undiagnosed um, and, and listen to them, ask questions about um, if they are participating in research, how, what kind of opportunities exist, um, and then what are some of the barriers to participating in research. Did the same thing with other community stakeholders, so researchers, um, providers, other community organizations, um, and ask those stakeholders similar questions. Um, are they um, engaging women in research? If so, how? If not, why? What are the barriers um, that they were encountering? Um, and kind of, you know, use those themes from, from both of those um, stakeholder groups um, and you know, to kind of come together to bring those two groups together and start conversations. Next up, um, our second aim 
was to create a community-based research network. Um, and so we, we did this at the um, brought a group of, of community stakeholders and um, the patients and then other stakeholders together um, and worked in this um, community-based research network to, um, to, to hash out kind of the, the topics that are really relevant um, for patients and, um, and then outline a research agenda. There's not been that much research done in women with bleeding disorders. And there's still so many unknowns out there as to the effect that uh, these bleeding in women have as we age, as well as um, just typical, you know, ways to impact everyday life for women with bleeding disorders. So many women are, are affected, um, especially with their monthly cycle and just lose days and days of either work or school um, because there's not really a gold standard for treating women with bleeding disorders. Our community has spent a lot of time um, focused on research predominantly in males with bleeding disorders, and appropriately so. That's the origin of all of this, even at the late treatment centers. But I think over the last few decades, I think we've started to recognize that women and girls need to have some research focus as well. And I think um, more recently, uh, we start to see a lot of patients come forward and tell their stories about their bleeding journeys. And I think this is a culmination of, of a lot of those stories. And I think it's one of the first sort of steps in the right direction to sort of create a roadmap, outline the needs, um, the unmet needs of this community. Women with bleeding disorders uh, just face a lot of trouble within the medical system at all levels, uh, mostly because there's just a lack of understanding and research into how bleeding disorders truly affect us. Uh, and, and in all, all facets, right? I mean, you know, most common thing would be at hemophilia treatment centers or at a gynecologist's office. But it really goes down to, too, like, if I go to the dentist and I have to tell them I have a bleeding disorder, like, they kind of look at me like I'm crazy. It's very apparent that, I mean, we know that we need a lot more research in this area from an education advocacy standpoint, as well as actually just improve clinical care and outcomes. Um, so it's exciting to see um, a real push to address some of these um, unanswered questions. I was diagnosed just about six years ago and realized real quick that women weren't getting acknowledged um, and even if they were lucky enough to get a diagnosis they weren't getting treatment proper treatment just through my diagnosis I found a voice that I didn't know I had and I've just been you know so blessed to get to know so many people and you know to help women so when I was asked to join this it was like yes you know I get to to see some of the doctors that you know are working on this type of stuff and I get to share my story share stories that other women are constantly calling me and you know telling me about this whole project is focusing on females, and there is not, not such a big research on the females at all. So that was the best part about best part for me to participate in is that they are focusing on us, you know. And and finally, we are going to have a machine on the table too. Yeah, I um, thought it was a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about research from a different perspective, um, and to kind of shift the lens of how we ask questions as researchers um, to be more patient focused and patient centered um, and to hear some of the patient's experiences with research and um, kind of the questions or outcomes that were most important to them um, and uh, you know to help with the project um, for the HFA but also to help inform my own research and my own um, efforts to think about how do we incorporate the patient voice into what we're doing. It's been wonderful. It, the group has been um, very respectful of one another. There has been no uh, hierarchy, uh, you know, between patient and provider, um, which we were afraid, you know, might happen. Um, really wonderful conversation and dialogue in those in those meetings. Very open um, and really great partnership. Um, I think, you know, there's been um, some lack of trust. From page, between patients and provider in this community, and you know, we started to see some of those um, walls come down in these meetings, and, and I think um, just you know, a respect was was gained or earned um, between those two groups. 
So it was really wonderful um, to see. What was great about the experience was getting to connect um, on this level with patients and their experiences and trying to hear, you know, um, you know, since I've never addressed, you know, a research question um, with the direct involvement of patients, you know, in terms of bringing up research ideas, um, talking about, you know, think their frustrations with their clinical experience, um, which echoed some of the things that I knew, but also brought up sort of other areas I was less aware of and, and also reminded me some of the very basic questions that we still haven't adequately um, addressed for patients. Um, they really wanted you know, to hear more about it and, and to address. And so it was kind of fun to, to have that perspective and develop a project in collaboration you know, with patients you know, struggling with these very issues. It was wonderful. It was emotional. It was uh, instructive. Would you come to this um, to this uh, kind of uh, meetings and um, and projects? And you come thinking, "Oh my God, I'm having the worst day of my life. I cannot believe that so many things are happening to me." And then you realize that there are people that have gone through so many, many more challenges. Challenges. I'm sorry. Than yourself. And that they're standing and fighting uh, to, I mean, to be here, to have their voices here. And then uh, you realize, you know, that um, that it's not you only, that uh, we are all in this together. I mean, that there are a lot of women that are uh, going through the same experiences, emotions, that are going through the same path that you are going. And the journey is easier when you have other people with you. I, I think one of the most powerful things to me was to see how the patient experience was very much validated in, in, in some ways um, but by the conversations that the clinicians were having. And, and so the clinicians were talking about things and, and areas where, where much more research was needed and or where a you know, research question had not been answered. And then when the patients share their experience, you know, it, it absolutely validated that that scientific approach or that science, that research question. We were able to take the uh, you know a woman's entire lifespan and help identify the different stages in their lives and identify where the issues are that need to be addressed that are maybe unique to that certain stage in their life. And you know we've obviously identified things that you know other groups have identified. So it's it, it's kind of nice to see that there are themes that are universal that the community feels need to be answered, but also my colleagues feel need to be answered. You know, particularly around um, you know obviously there needs to be more attention on reproductive tract bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding, and you know there's little to no research being done in the in the period around um, menopause. Um, and so I think. If our researchers see this and other groups are also highlighting this, I'm hoping that some young investigators will take this on and say, okay, well, you know, this hasn't been addressed. This could be my research project and this is where I can invest my time. This whole project is not only focusing on one kind of females or women. They are covering each and every age group. And that's the best part about that. And again, we are not only fo focusing on the healthcare part or the bleeding disorder, they are focusing on the mindset, the the history, the family, the you know, patient and everything. So that, that's amazing. You know, I learned so many things I learned about other types of uh, bleeding disorders that affect women that I didn't have an idea of them. And it's so important, right? Um, and just not, not just for the fact that you are learning about them, but the fact that you have more empathy or others, right? That you, you know that you think that your condition is bad and then you feel others and you are like, oh my God. Uh, and then the doctors to be able to have them in the group and have them hear our voices because that has been such a big issue for women with hemophilia uh, to be patronized, dismissed, uh, ridiculized, you know? Um, and then to have the doctor here, and it's not one patient, it's a group of patients telling, yes, yeah, this is what we are going through and this is what we need. And I was thinking about some of the conversations we had um, in our in our group discussions about grooving as a symptom. And as a as a clinician, you know, I think about grooving, I'm like, oh well, we don't have to treat that. It's not something that we do really anything about for the most part. 
Um, and it's kind of a more like, okay, it's noted, and then we'll move on. And I think in some of the discussions that we had, maybe this isn't particular to research, but in how I interact with my patients, I was learning a little bit more about how the bruises are really like an outward um, manifestation and kind of a really visible to yourself and to other symptom that's like this reminder every time you look down and you see the bruise and, and you think about it your bleeding disorder and it's like a, a kind of a sudden oh yeah i have this or and this affects this and this affects what i do and i was like oh this is i got to rethink about how i talk to my patients and families about bruises um and that we often kind of dismiss them because they don't need treatment but that's and i think that's potentially how we think about a lot of bleeding events um that may not require treatment and it shifts our frame of mind and um we're like, oh, it's not that severe, but it actually is really impactful. And so the severity isn't like how low your factor level is, but it's how impactful it is on your experience. And um, I think that's an important shift that I've had from this experience is to think a little bit more on how does this specific thing affect this specific person rather than that population. And then we can kind of go back up to the population level. One of the most shocking things is that let's say a, a mother takes her son to an HTC or to a hematologist who's very well versed in blood disorders. A lot of times they don't test the women in the family, like the sisters, the mom, or the aunt for bleeding disorders. And that's shocking to me because obviously, like women are affected too. And sure, they they may not be classified as uh, like severe, which that's another question that we brought up is like, well, what's severe for women? Because Severe for women may look different than men. It may manifest in, in menstrual cycles or in, in bleeding post-pregnancy, things like that. Um, so that was that was kind of shocking, but it was also really cool to hear one of the clinicians say, she's like, oh no, everybody that walks into my through my office, like the women all get tested. She's like, I want daughters, I want aunts, I want sisters, I want cousins. And she's like, because I know what it's genetic and you have to test she's like but at the same time too if somebody walks into my clinic with itp even though it's not genetic there is a genetic form that's extremely rare and if mom says well my my dad had a platelet disorder and now her child has a platelet disorder we need to check for that genetic disease because it could be there there's a very real opportunity for us to get feedback from the broader patient and research community to provide input and then you know, make it a stronger document and refine it further, and then figure out how do we turn those research questions that are in this agenda into an actual project. And you know, for us, it's it's about these. Oh, we've already vetted these projects and identified that they're important to women, that they're important to the community, and so with that sort of, sort of stamp of approval from all of these stakeholders then how do we reach out to those who are interested in research, whether it's industry, whether it's academia or, or other organizations and say, you know, let's partner to make these projects happen. And so that's really where, where we would like to see the research agenda go. Ultimately, the reason we do what we do and the reason we do research is to improve care for patients, you know, to help answer questions and provide the best care. And we're hearing from them, and again, again, no, you're not, you know, I get the same lack of knowledge or questions from my providers, or, you know, I continue to, no one seems to know about this or that, you know, and we hear that again and again from multiple patients over the years, you know, I think we've heard that loud and clear from this, the, the group that we work with. Bringing um, this group of people together, those with bleeding disorder, as well as the, um, several of the treaters, um, and putting together the research agenda that we that we did um, can really have some benefit for increasing awareness as well as um, increasing the benefits for treating women in the long run with um, with bleeding disorders. Kind of that model of having a patient story kind of ground some discussions um, is a really important thing to. To push for in kind of everything that we do. Um, I think there's so much value in hearing somebody's experience and framing our either clinical work or our research work around those stories. And so I think that 
even you know as simple as that kind of feels as like oh we could just have a patient talk about their experience before we dive into our meeting at um, the American Society of Hematology Conference or something like that it really elevates that patient's voice and some of those things you know it's important that we take what we got from here because it's a combination of both the patient and provider perspective oftentimes in many groups we have a small patient perspective um, and uh, it's important, like, for example, you know, the guidelines that were recently produced that included a patient perspective. Sometimes uh, it's nice to have those that sort of originate from industry, but they originate from, from online medical societies. It's also nice to see ideas that come directly from the community and then sort of supported by the provider. So um, you want to see what, how did they rank as things that we absolutely need to work on, things that are critical, things that need uh, immediate address. This whole project is about changing the mindset, changing the perception, um, and uh, educating ourselves first before we can go out and educate other people. So, and that's the best thing that I learned about this project, that they are they are planning, not only changing the mindset of the patients and caregivers, but providers as well. Um, all, all these people in the healthcare industry, they want to change the mindset and educate them about the human sort of living disorder because there are doctors here in the community, they don't acknowledge that humans can do this. So uh, this, this research project, project is going to, I'm sure, help them as well with that new things about human physical disorder. So that's, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about that. I hope to be more involved. I hope a HFA continues on with this. If there's further projects where we can start like going beyond the research, setting the research agenda and, and working towards, you know, educational materials or, you know, hopefully when we get back to in-person conferences, you know, having a meeting at, at the next big hemophilia conference and talking about this. And I also hope to kind of bring in women with other living disorders, like myself with ITP, because all of us are impacted by this at the end of the day. Like if, if women with hemophilia are being cared for, women with ITP definitely are being cared for. If uh, the process is long and I don't get to enjoy the results of this wonderful research, I know that my daughter or her kids or my son's daughters or anybody for that matter, I mean, uh, that is a, a woman affected by, by this medical condition will be able to enjoy the results of whatever comes from this research. So we have Amina and Laval are going to um, kind of speak a little bit further on the importance of patient centered. Do we still need to see? Yes. So I I know have a few slides, but I don't have to use them. Um, and Amina, if you want to join me up here, yeah. I want to do this alone. Okay. So we had Amina going first, but we can okay, yeah. we're having more. So go first. No, big, yeah, being a part of this project, um, I would say it was an honor. But before I say anything, I read it a few years ago somewhere that usually females say it takes up to 16 years for a female to get diagnosed. So that's a big, you know, if we think about that for a minute, it's a big deal for any female here who is dealing with bleeding disorder to get diagnosed. Um, so that was definitely one of the things. Or And then I was thinking like, Either I can sit down and just complain or do something. And I was glad that HFA was doing something during COVID. And that was some of one of my COVID projects to participate in this uh, Wired Academy and then CDRN project um, that I was part of um, as a community member. 
um, I'm glad that it was not only community member talking to each other. We had such a diverse group. Um, we met, I was thinking we met six. We had like six meetings, but maybe it was five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was such a learning thing for, um, as everyone was saying that we learn a lot from um, providers, from other community members, from HFA, from other, you know, everyone in the group, we had equal input. Um, and um, so one part what we did is that was the best part we did. And I'm glad uh, for both of you to starting this thing. So we divided each state in female's house. Um, and then we asked everyone to vote which state they want to focus. So my uh, focus was adolescence so it's, um, because I felt like that is very important age for any female. And everyone in the group had different age group that they focus on. Um, and we had big group meetings and then we have small group meetings for just to focus on that particular age group. So that was good. Um, and if you have any question about my experience, I would love to share, but overall it was one of the best experience and I think I wish that there are more female and more community members involved and we can expand this to the next level. And yes, uh, I cannot wait to see how these things come into action and impact everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to just kind of briefly touch on Pokori, um, but before I do, uh, I want to also say that that um, obviously you saw that I was in the video, so I was <laughs> part of HFA uh, for uh, three years before I joined Pokori earlier uh, in this year, and um, this project was a, a really transformative and for me in the way that I um, understood it in a very practical way how important the patient perspective is in designing um, clinical research. And so not only thinking about my experience before I joined HFA was very much focused on, on measurement development and how do we um, you know, think about what patient for measures are and how do we capture signs and symptoms of disease and how do we take that information and use it for product development or use it for other uh, purposes? But in this particular project, it wasn't, it was more about designing the research from the very beginning and understanding that across the continuum of the re of research, patients have roles <clears throat> to play. And it was really important for me, um, this project in, in really cementing that knowledge and that understanding and seeing how it applies. Um, because you you hear, you know, we kind of talk about it all the time, patient center, patient center, but it isn't until you do something like this that you start to see why um, the, the patient perspective is so critical in designing the research question. And so from that, from that very beginning, um, seeing how some nuisances and some more specific things come from having those conversations and taking the time to do that. And engagement is not easy. And, and you know, so now in my role at Pocori, part of what I do is, is talk about engagement all the time. So I, you know, I'm like a broken record about engagement. <laughs> but the idea is that we want people to understand and researchers to understand that bringing in patients from the moment that we start thinking about the research question throughout the design process and then the execution and the dissemination um, is really an important process. And so uh, that's what we do at Pocori. Um, we have very high expectations um, of engagement of our researchers. We are an organization that was created under the Affordable Care Act, uh, for those of you that, that don't know. Um, Obamacare, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, and on the, before you went through a reauthorization in 2019, and uh, there was a little bit of a shift in our, in our national priorities, but really uh, one of the main things that came out of that is that our focus right now is on achieving health equity, and that is one of our national priorities. And so when we talk about women, and women with bleeding disorders and the lack of information, the lack of evidence, these are all questions that are related to health equity. And so that's important for you to understand because there is a, a connection between what you all are doing in this room 
and achieving health equity. Um, so I, this just shows you a little bit of what the funding portfolio in Pecori is. You look here, my little circle got moved because I was trying to be creative. But <laughs> Macquarie funds, you know, the third most studied population for Macquarie is women. And so we do have, you know, a lot of studies around maternal and child health and studies that examine that continuum of the lifespan of women that we've been sort of talking about. It's, you know, it's a population that we have a lot of vested interest in and, and want to uh, continue to address. So what makes engagement, um, you know, something that, that we know that we need to be doing? So Bakuri has this portfolio of research studies that I just showed you. Uh, we have over 400 studies that we have funded. And when we look at engagement across our portfolio, we understand a few things that engagement does. Engagement talks to us about user orientation and acceptability. And so that means, you know, are we looking at the right research question? Are we, what patients um, and clinicians are willing to do? What the burden of that, um, of a study or a particular intervention is? And also, how do we align with the preferences and the values and the needs of, of uh, our participants. It also addresses feasibility. So when we engage patients, we understand if something is gonna work in clinical practice, if something is not going to, to function in a clinical setting, then how can we expect to generate science that will then eventually be disseminated and implemented if we're not developing it in the right way uh, from the very beginning. And so it also, engagement also affects the study of the, the quality of the study, uh, the relevance. So are we asking the right questions? Are we asking questions that address what patients are more concerned about and most interested about? And then also the engagement process is, is you know, defined in that study and what our stakeholders are equipped to do and able to do. And so that's also, you know, something that we consider. So I wanna talk about this piece, um, it's a summary of, a, of some literature that we reviewed and uh, just our, also our experiences working with the Bakori research portfolio, uh, particularly a couple things. Engagement is feasible in all research, not just comparative effectiveness research, which is what we focus on, but um, it also requires that you have a variety of stakeholders. And so it isn't just including patients and obviously you know, as a patient organization, HFA has certainly focused on, on uh, including the patient voice, but engagement is also about who else is at the table, which other stakeholders do you need? Do you need stakeholders that are gonna help you address payers? Do you need stakeholders that are gonna help you address policy makers? Do you need stakeholders that are gonna help you implement this in clinical settings? Uh, so it's really thinking about Thing, that entire spectrum of stakeholders, because they really influence how you design and how you conduct um, your research. It also engagement really affects your um, your research and makes it more meaningful. Engagement takes place over the course of the study, and it can happen in different ways, and it can happen um, in ways that are not not necessarily linear but very dynamic. And so what we mean by that is that you engage often, but you don't always engage in the same way. You can engage with a focus group at the beginning of the study and maybe a lot in a lot of different ways at the beginning of a study, but then towards the end, engage in a you know, less active way with certain stakeholders, but maybe are more focused at the end of your study on those that can help you disseminate the message and the results of your study. And so it benefits uh, community, stakeholders, patients, and really what we are trying to do by expecting having these expectations of our, of our researchers and people who are funded by our organization is that we're trying to transform the culture of healthcare research. And Macquarie has not only, I was recently at a conference and, and I kept hearing, hearing people referring to our materials and, and things like that. And, Pagori has had a significant influence in affecting how research is conducted. And, and we, as you think about 
the research that you want to do and the, the questions that are out there, think about how um, our expectations around engagement and what we know from an experience that works and what you have seen through the projects that HSA has presented, mm -hmm. uh, think about how you can involve some of those levels of engagement because they will make your science better ultimately. Um, so engagement is not perfect. You know, there's, it costs money, it takes time, it is challenging. It involves, you know, working with stakeholders that at times you may find challenging to develop relationships, to develop communication. And so not saying that, that this is easy work by any stretch of the imagination, but it's important, it's relevant, and it will make your studies better. So you are sort of at this stage, right, in the, in the um, development of your, of your research projects. You're thinking about topic selection and prioritizing your research questions. And as you do that, you know, think about who do you need to talk to? Who do you need to have conversations with? And then as you get to the proposal review process and the design, you know, there's room for patience in this space too. And so I wanna encourage you to, to think about that as well. And also in your dissemination and your evaluation. So I am done with my slides, but <laughs> I just wanna say um, one more thing, the, the experience of um, working with research, I and my portfolio at Pecori is a rare disease portfolio. And uh, so I work with researchers who are doing rare disease studies using different tools that, that Pecori has available to them. And the experience consistently with each of those um, researchers and research team is that the earlier they start their engagement and the more inclusive their engagement is, the better their study is. And it affects their recruitment. It affects their ability to be able to, to reach out to communities and create um, sort of excitement and a desire for um, this these projects to be successful. And so I would encourage um, you know any of you to develop that are here to ensure that you develop those relationships and take advantage of being in this room and, and all the other people that HFA has put you in touch with as an opportunity to start to think about engagement. Um, and then I'll talk about actual funding opportunities in a little bit later. So, but I'll stop here. One, two, three, I love you. <laughs> We're going to start with the agenda. Um, I know the agenda we had started, uh, but she had a last minute emergency. So Jill has graciously agreed to share this story with us. Um, you can stay there if you want. Or, oh, oh, yeah. So talk in the direction of the oh, owl. Oh, the owl. Oh, 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 the owl, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I'll just come up here. Um, so hi, everybody. I introduced myself earlier, but my name is Jill McCary. Uh, I have been in this community for quite a few years. In fact, I really enjoyed the timeline that Carrie had put up because it gave me a chance to look back and kind of reflect it. Oh, yeah. I, I have been in I have been in this community a long time because sometimes I feel a little like I don't quite belong, you know? So anyways, my story is, uh, first off, I am adopted. So I do not know my family history. Um, my mom first noticed that I, as a child, I had lots of nosebleeds, lots of bruising. She was concerned with the bruising. So she took me into the doctor, the pediatrician, and he told my mom that I had easy bruising syndrome. <laughs> so you know my mom didn't know any better of course I was you know like eight and uh so we just she just figured that I I bruised easily and that was okay when I had my teeth and my teeth would fall out I would bleed a lot just those nose bleeds were terrible um and you know I just I just lived as a kid and then I got into adolescence 
And so once I, once I started my periods, oh my goodness, it was horrible. I would have, they were upside down. So I'd be 28 days on, five days off. 28 days on, five days off. And I lived through the shower at PE time. I don't know how many of you had that time where you went to PE and then you had to take a shower and it was a requirement. And the only time for us, us females when we didn't have to take a shower was when we were having our periods. And so we had to, you know, bring a note. Well, I had a note for 28 days and no note for five days. And I actually had my PE teacher when I was in ninth grade, call me out on the carpet during class in the gym full of boys and girls and loudly let me know that my note telling, telling her that I was having my period was not going to be accepted by her. And I just remember how, and I was a shy, very shy kid. And that was devastating to me. So, you know, going from that, then I was, I was just constantly worried that I was going to bleed through. You know, I was the girl that was always leaning over to my neighbor. Hey, please, can you check? Please, can you check? Because every time I stood up, I was convinced that I was going to be that girl at, at school where the accident had happened. So my mom took, marched me off to a gynecologist who promptly put me on birth control. So I was on birth control from the time I was 14 um, and until I had my daughter, basically. So uh, I, had, I had my daughter. I got married. Got, and then a couple of years later, um, we decided to start a family, still didn't have any idea. <coughs> I just figured that was what I did. That was just me. And so I got pregnant. The pregnancy was fine. I ended up having a C-section. So bled a little more than what the doctor had, had thought was normal, but nothing, nothing was ever said. So got a got actually got diagnosed by an emergency room doctor that I rode horses with. I had gone out to clean stalls and was in a pair of shorts because it gets really hot where, where I lived. And I was covered with bruises. I looked like a Dalmatian most of the time. And so she just happened to mention, hey, do you look like that all the time? Yeah, pretty much. This is what I look like. And she actually said, well, you might have von Willebrand disease. You probably want to get that checked out. So I thought, okay. So I just picked a hematologist kind of out of the, out of the phone book and thought, here we go. So went in, had a, had a discussion with him. He told me you might have leukemia. You could have this thing called von Willebrand disease, but we're going to get your blood tested. And then when the results come in, we'll let you know. So two weeks of just panic. I have a brand new baby. I'm thinking, you know, the whole two weeks, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I have leukemia and I'm not going to be here for her. So when the doctor called on Sunday and said, you don't have leukemia, so that's great. You just have this thing called von Willebrand disease. Come on into the office and we'll talk about it. And so this was on a Sunday. So my husband and I immediately think this doctor is way up here because he called on a Sunday and let us know that our lives were not over. So I went to go and see him uh, without my husband because at that point we're thinking, this is good. So I go in and he says, oh, you've got this thing called von Willebrand disease. That's okay. You know, this is before computers. So, okay. So don't worry about it. You'll outgrow it. <laughs> so I went, yeah, I know we're all laughing. I went for, oh my goodness, probably I was trying to do the math. I must have gone at least 12 years just thinking, oh, this is great. I just have von Willebrand disease. So no big deal. Although it should have put me in when I went back to my my gynecologist to talk to him about, okay, you know, my husband and I are thinking about having more kids. And he 
promptly stopped me and said, if you're thinking of having any more children, go find another doctor. He said, I've had three Von Willebrand patients, one who's opted not to have kids, you who bled substantially during delivery and one I almost lost on the table. And so it still didn't, it's, you know, I still didn't think about it. Didn't really think about it because I didn't, I didn't know. So I fast forward, you know, a dozen years. I, uh, my mom calls me up and says, you want to go to a women's expo? My first question was, is lunch involved? <laughs> and she said, yes. And so I said, good. Yeah, I'll come. We can go to the expo and then we can go to lunch. So we get into this expo, walk through the door. I turn around the corner and the first thing I see is this big sign saying, do you have nosebleeds? Do you bruise? Do you have heavy periods? You might have von Willebrand disease. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. So my mom and I are talking. And by the way, my mom is now a nurse. So when I was 15, she went to nursing school. So she's now a nurse. So I'm really excited because I'm thinking I get to see somebody else with von Willebrand disease. So I walk up and I said, well, I have that. And she's, oh, she's like, oh, that's, you know, you know, not yay, but you know, she's <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's, that's great. What product do you use? And I know you guys have probably had that moment where somebody says something to you and you have the internal monologue of, do I admit that I have absolutely no idea what she's talking about? Or do I just say, you know, I just sat there and I thought product, product, what's a product? And so I just said, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. Uh, she panicked <laughs> a little bit and she took me, kind of took me under her arm and she was like, okay, well, write your name down. <laughs> so anyways, it turns out, as it turns out, the full, you know, this, this lovely cycle that, that we have in life, she was the patient that almost, see, I'm not, I'm trying not to get emotional. No she was the patient that almost died on the table. Mm -hmm. And she was the first person that showed me how to advocate for myself. And so it was, it, it, yeah, life comes full circle. But my story has just, it mirrors so many other stories that I hear. Um, the, I, I was lucky. I got the diagnosis the first time. So I feel very, very blessed and lucky that that happened to me. I didn't have to wait that, you know, that 16 years, that first time I, I got tested, that happened. But I spent the next dozen years not knowing what to do, not knowing that there were things to do. So I look back at my life and think I would have had more than one child. You know, so it, it impacted my life in, in different ways. I also lived in a very rural area where the closest HTC, four hours away across the mountains. So for me to get to an HTC in the winter time, not really much, you know, not really, not really feasible. And so I ended up, um, going to a local hematologist, but he specialized in oncology. I had to teach myself what I had to figure out what I needed and then really advocate for myself. Um, one, of the, one of the things that really, I guess, pushed me the most was my first ever surgery after finding out about products. <laughs> My first surgery, I went in, I, like I said, I lived in a rural area. I lived about 30 miles from the closest town. So I opted to go in and they just put a line in and I thought, well, I'll take care. I can take care of that myself or my mom can come out because she's a nurse. And so I went in, they put the line in, I had the surgery, did the, did the seven days. And then I ended up with the flu. So I called this, this, uh, home health care to have the nurse come out to my house to pull the IV out. And I'm not a very strong 
person, you know, when it comes to advocating for myself at that point. So I was like, I'm sorry, you know, could I please have a nurse come out because I have the flu, I'm throwing up, I'm dehydrated, I don't feel good, this is kind of hurting, and I was promptly told no. We don't have anybody that can come out to where you're at, sorry, we'll be out in two days. And I kept thinking to myself, I can't, I can't do this for two more days, I'm throwing up, I, you know, so I reiterated, I'm throwing up, I'm dehydrated, I don't feel good, this hurts two days. And so I finally just said, you know what, maybe I should pull it out myself. And you know what she said? Maybe you should. <clears throat> so at that point, I decided I was no longer going to be at the mercy of somebody else's time frame. So I, I kind of asked around you. So, oh, oh, this is the best part. I forgot about this. So I called my daughter. <laughs> hey, come on down here. She came down and said, well, you're going to help me. Do you want to hold or do you want to pull? <laughs> and she said, I don't want either. Um, and the funny thing is she's actually now a women's health nurse practitioner and a certified nurse midwife. So <laughs> my girl that didn't like blood and needles. Um, but so anyways, um, she ended up holding. I ended up pulling. Long story short, I had a little mess to clean up after that. Uh, but that was one of the Looking back, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I realized that I can take control of those things that I had relinquished to somebody else. There are certain things that I can control. And so I decided that I was going to learn, just like the kids at camp, I was going to learn to self infuse. And my mom couldn't do it. She, <laughs> she's like, I, I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can help you. So I said, well, that's fine. I stopped a nurse at church and I just said, just kind of tell me what I, you know, he said, I think he said like 15 degrees or something like that. So I just went home and started practicing. And uh, it hasn't stopped since then. And it has been something that I have just felt very, very fortunate that some of the things that have happened to me have, because it's made me who I am, not in just the bleeding disorders aspect, but I truly appreciate everything that HFA is doing to get this moving forward for, for um, now I'm trying to use, for females, <laughs> so that, uh, like I said before, that we're no longer the redheaded stepchildren, that we can get our needs met. And, uh, but I, I do, I appreciate everything that is done in our behalf because this fight is not over, but we've got a good, we've got a great start on it. So thank you very much. Okay. So presentation of the research agenda, hopefully everybody's had time to read it already. It was sent out. Uh, via email. I hope everybody got it. And then you have the physical copies in front of you. And those of you on Zoom, hopefully it's in the chat. Okay. So let us know if you have trouble opening that and we could share it too on the screen, but I thought it'd be easier if we didn't. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how this came about. I think you already have a pretty good idea from all the sessions we've had this afternoon so far. Um, but I just wanted to paint the picture a little bit more. So uh, with the first project, we had the CBRN, our community-based research network, which we've told you had uh, patients and researchers and then other stakeholders in this community. And we could kind of just started with sticky notes. And of course it was virtual sticky notes because it was, you know, <laughs> but we had, you know, we just had everybody kind of put up on the board what they thought was important to research what they thought needed to be explored more. Um, and as we did that, we kind of started to notice this pattern emerging um, where they went into different categories, right? And so that's why we have these, um, what did I call it? The focus areas, right? So we have um, the lifespan, so topics that kind of fit across a, a, a female's lifespan, right? And then adolescence, 
um, because we did have quite a few topics that were more specific to that time frame, um, especially going through puberty, um, and then also dealing with school, um, social networks being built out and everything. Um, and then we have the reproductive age, um, and then menopause, which kind of includes, you know, post-menopause as well. Um, so that's kind of how we framed it all out using those, those focus areas. Um, and so that is, if you look at Appendix A, that's all the topics that we kind of came up with and then organized in that way. So then um, Amina touched on this. Uh, after that, we actually asked everybody, we broke up into groups and we asked everybody to pick one topic that was uh, especially important to them and then to actually build out research questions, um, what kind of method they envision uh, exploring that question with, a recruitment strategy, and then the data analysis and collection um, plan. So this is definitely not a blueprint of what we think you should do down to the letter, but this was just us exploring a way that this could be um, uh, could be researched. Um, so that's Appendix B. Um, so we kind of built this out, we framed it out this way. Um, and then with the steering committee over the past year, we took the same document, um, we asked them to review it, we added a couple topics, we added a question or two, um, we actually, I think we took away a couple too that we felt like didn't fit in with the grand scheme anymore. Um, we refined the life stages more, so we, we just, we tried to, um, define them more what we're what we're envisioning for those different uh focus areas and then the other thing we did was we tried to highlight the patient voice a little bit more so if you look at appendix a there's uh i believe just one topic area in each i mean topic in each focus area that's red so in lifespan there's social health disparities in adolescence there's the universal screening tool and then reproductive age, we had childbirth complications and menopause was bleeding disorder symptoms over time. So the way we came up with that was to actually ask all of the patient community members of the steering committee and of the CBRN what they thought, the, the top three, we asked for top three most important areas and we gathered all that. And then we actually put it to, um, to one of our sister space chats and we asked all the women that joined the sister space chat what they thought the most important things were and so those that that one that's highlighted is the one that that most women um selected for those those focus areas so um that's all i really wanted to go over but we have time now for questions um and we're going to have candace kind of facilitate questions and any edits or comments that you have on the agenda and I'll be taking notes as well so that we can capture all those comments so and I wonder if we should do it in the front just so we're closer to the oh to the owl yeah. we want to make sure we can hear okay are we all good okay And then this will naturally transition into the panel um, coming up. So yeah. for the panelists, because we have people on Zoom this time around, we'll probably just roll over up front here so that the owl can pick us up. <laughs> so, okay. So I guess the big question is just um, if there are any high level questions or if there's things you know to consider or stuff that we may have missed. I, I start off with a, a high level question is how does this and are, are there any parallels with this research agenda with a perhaps broader research agenda you as HMA has as a community as, as a whole? And and the reason I ask that is is that are there might there be opportunities where you could research something here and you know kind of do broader research and then you know do a women's study as a sub study or something in a broader sense. So HMA we've kind of stepped away from the term research, um, it, it's not, it didn't resonate well with the community. Um, it, what we ended up doing was more patient engagement and education around research. I think that's really the role that HFA played um, in a research project. Um, so I think we're open to, to conversations um, 
for other projects and having, you know, to your point, having a, 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 a woman's focused research project fall under something else. I mean, we would definitely take a look at that, but our role, we don't have to really have the infrastructure um, to, to roll out an entire research project. We need to be partners, um, which is why we convened all of you here. So yeah, I, I would say, yes, we're open to, um, to broader topics and, and definitely some of the to follow up with that. Yes, um, just an observation. Like I noticed just throughout the document, sometimes it's women, sometimes it's women and girls, which we talk about science assistance. I think there are other groups outside of HFA that have women and girls as a focus area. And we hear that um, terminology much more commonly than just women alone. And I'm wondering like whether or not just in terms of like what's on the front cover, does it make a difference whether you call it for women with eating disorders or for women and girls with eating disorders? Just a kind of, it, it's just an observation. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I think um, because we do, you know, adolescence is part of that. Yeah. That would be a good to include. Yeah, and I think this might make it easier as we kind of go across the same shoulders yeah. to say that we're like, that's a good question. Thank you. Some of the internal conversations that we had did focus on sort of like the adolescent aspect of what was life like. Like, I mean, Julia had given us great insight into like what her teenage years were like originally, like not knowing what was going on and not understanding it. And then I look back, I mean, I wasn't diagnosed till I was 27, but when I was listening to everybody talk about like the heavy periods and then the medications that they were put on and then the mitigation factors, I was given the same exact treatments and kind of that reaction. And so one thing I think that we could also take away from it too was like, it would be very interesting for us to have a conversation with like a bunch of teenage girls that are in our, our space <laughs> Uh -huh. And be like, so what do you think? So when we were kind of just going off of a little bit of what, um, if we could go back in time, yeah. what what kind of questions would we ask right now? Right. Uh, and then ultimately, it, then it kind of ran into um, to those childbearing years and, and getting up, you know, getting into adulthood and then going into menopause, um, which is another area that is, none of us had any, any answers, <laughs> but we had a lot of questions. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody on Zoom too? I know that. <laughs> Adrian will let us know. Okay, perfect. We've perfect. Got a whole system. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to Mr. Me. I think you know through our work that women are really women and girls <laughs> are really our priority. Um, you know, this is this is what we have worked and, and done all of these efforts for. It's, you know, as we've noted, it's really underserved. Um, population in the community, so I think that is where we would like to drive our efforts. Oh, certainly, yeah. And I'm not, I, I'm not inviting you guys getting away from that effort. I'm, just, I'm thinking about where you can, you know, give them a, you know, get a two for one punch if you can. Right, and I think that'll hopefully that'll be part of our discussion a little later too with the uh, what research research is being done already and how can we include women in the stuff that's already mm -hmm. out there. That's a really good point. And, and I honestly have the same thought that occurred to me with, with regards to when you mentioned menopause. I mean, menopause in general is pretty understood. And if there are other, like, if there's other research going on in menopause or if it, 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 they can encourage research in the population and then flip in the, uh, the bleeding sort of community and that, or not flip it in, but yeah, <laughs> in a meeting. Mm -hmm. Follow on question to that. So I'm sitting here. I think this is a great work product. Like, really good. And I want to put out your. So I'm sitting here looking at this fantastic work product from what you guys have as a researcher. And I'm like, can I bring this back to my, you know, FBI group, can I, you know, these kinds of questions. I'm like, well, how do how do I help facilitate getting them into research? So it'd be great to have a conversation so that it's not as ad hoc as my current thing, which is like emailing them the PDF. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it would be great to like 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 convey that to you because we want to know how to do the next step because we need to keep our heavy lifting. But I don't have any idea what that really looks like other than for awareness. And I think that's where the you know that's the kind of that launch we have. That's where these conversations need to happen. We need to know who's doing what, who can do what, um, how we can support one another to to really drive these forward. And because I think that's kind of a missing link on both sides, on all sides actually is you know, what what are each other's roles and where can we support each other and truly get to work and stop talking about getting to work, but actually putting the wheels in motion. Everybody knows we're going to want to play, but just before we're going to say everything. <laughs> um, this is fantastic. This is great. And I know this is a general like, agenda for every woman in, in this country, but I want to know about my, my marriages. I want to know about this kind of thing. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with minorities and women that are under step in the health area? No insurance living in rural areas, the language barrier. What are we going to do uh, with with this uh, woman if we're family? And also, um, are these going to be also in Spanish or any other language that people in older women or HCPs or I don't know healthcare providers are going to be able to see it and to say these women are talking. But I also want to ask them. I also want them involved. How are we going to do that? HTCs are are HTCs involved also? Um, provider chapters? Not yet. I mean, this is the agenda. This is what we're proposing. This is what we're putting forward to take through HTC. Providers were involved in developing it. Um, patients were involved in developing it. Um, you know, women of color, we, we tried to get representation. Um, so I, I think those are great questions, and I think we need to keep pushing, you know, that agenda forward as well. And that it's for, for all women in, in the community. Mm -hmm. I was like, she kind of answered it. My thing is, is like it, it always specifically says, you know, the A, B, or Bangalore brands. Don't forget about us prayers because this is something that we can be involved in because it's not, um, it, 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 you know, you're going over the life scan, the adolescence, and stuff like that. And my thing is, like, there shouldn't be just those specific three little groups because those are the ones that are always seem to be in any type of group, as even for the males, you know, there are rarers for males, but. My thing is just don't forget about thought prayers. So I mean, you know, and, and as much as we can, yeah, it'll be included. I think again, it's, we need to make a jump somewhere, and hopefully, um, you know, the smaller the the population size, the harder it is to get a project going and supported, and to find the participants even. So um, we need to start. Yeah, but I, I absolutely yeah. agree. <laughs> but thank you for being here. We dream, Jen. That sort of segues into what I was sitting here thinking, just trying to kind of integrate all of this information and figure out, you know, at least in the, the video and kind of everything we talked about since lunch, kind of how to put this into action and trying to figure out like if there was already sort of a, a vision for that. And I'm kind of getting the sense that there really isn't, or maybe that's what this conversation is centered around, is how to like initiate actually working at these projects. And I, because I'm entrenched in this right now, just keep coming back to the idea of like, well, it's going to take time. Like it always comes back to that, right? So like, it, it's going to take money and it's going to take multi, multiple institutions to answer questions on various orders. So kind of trying to overcome the silos that exists within the uh, hemophilia and food disorders community of, you know, like these are where this is where the information is held, and these are the the places where the money comes from, and trying to figure out how do we make that to get everyone on the same page, 
and then access a source of funding that would be able to, to answer these questions. And I don't have like a solution to that. I don't know if it has to do with, you know, appealing to the NIH of what the priorities are of HFA to increase the likelihood that they're going to fund these types of projects, or if it's to apply for a bigger grant and then, you know, uh, solicit applications from different centers that would specifically answer these questions that the HFA can kind of sort of be the sponsor for. Um, but I feel like there's a hundred different ways that we can answer a hundred different wonderful questions and until we know where that money's going to come from. And I feel like it's hard to really take the next steps. Mm -hmm. We didn't discuss this. I mean, so my 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 thinking was very similar to Dr. Moyers. The the National Inventory Foundation did a state of the science meeting last year, and they had six or seven work groups. One was on a similar set of topics. They had uh, there was a research that identified through that project, and I think the papers will be out after the first of the year. Uh, and I, I was struck having read this last night, and then. Be familiar with and have read your presentations of what's in the state of science. There really is kind of overlap. And I, in terms of the funding, I think there probably is only sort of one bite of the apple with the core to get a large kind of inventory of funding research project initially or through some of the major funders. So I guess what I was going to suggest is maybe it would be useful to do a little bit of a mapping exercise um, with the other organizations. Their research has been doing this one, figure out where there's commonalities, and either decide that you know, we'll take this path and take that path, or this is a really big one, uh, and maybe we should go jointly and do it together. Because there are other out, out there, what, I, what I'm encouraged about is the similarity in the world. There's certainly unique pieces. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I am a very curious person, so I have multiple questions. So the first one, uh, the first thing I want to say is that the beauty of this program is that we have all the actors of the play represented here. And it will be wonderful if the representatives from the, uh, you know, the, or the pharmaceutical companies or specialty pharmacies can go back uh, to their offices with the information of what we have, of the need that has been established. Uh, I mean, it, with this program, something wonderful happened. Uh, patients, providers, you know, we got together and we realized, okay, there is this area that needs to have more research done, the quality of life of these people, and, and even their lives in some cases are at stake and we need to do something. And one question here is, uh, is the agenda going to be published uh, with me? <laughs> with me. <laughs> Sorry. Is this agenda going to be published? Is it going to go, uh, I don't know, to, to spread the word in the medical community? Are you planning to, to publish the results of this uh, research? We're planning to share it as much as we can. Um, I'm not sure about actually publishing like in an official medical journal or anything, but we want to get it out there as much as we can. Yeah, that will be great. And, and with those organizations that uh, that you were talking about, I mean, it would be wonderful to see what organizations, I don't know the CDC or any other organization that will be interested you know, in providing assistance and communicating to HFA, you know, so that the doctors that have been involved in these studies can, can start like really moving on and do something about it. That will be amazing, you know, uh, because, you know, we put all our um, energy in, in love and, and heart in this project. So it will be amazing if it's the start of, of a new chapter, right? Uh, for the women in the hemophilia community. So, so really, Dr. I hope to see you soon researching and I <laughs> So I'm so sorry. I feel like let's pause for a second. We have a few more slides to go through and then we'll discuss. We have a long, like, what is it? An hour and a half or something that we can talk. Um, but we wanted to give you just a little bit more information first. Um, 
Any other, was there any other burning comments about the research agenda specifically, like comments or edits or, yeah? Okay, go for it. The door. <laughs> it's a follow-on to the conversation about implementation and research, which is you guys they know more than anyone else. The scope of the problem is big. And when you have big scopes, it's really challenging to know how to get started. Any successes will help you do the next thing. So that and we can help with this too, but it's not only I think anywhere in the lifespan of research, there's a possibility to take this. A project that's already done, a project that's going on, a project that's being planned but has funding, how to get new funding, and anywhere the traction is will help the rest of the agenda. So you don't have to do it all at once. And how many bites you get of apples? Like, hopefully it's a fruit bowl, <laughs> and there's multiple bites and multiple tastes. There's just so much to do. But centralizing the success is back to support things to keep going and make the momentum and keep your business at a Okay, so just sort of to, to follow along with a lot of what you're talking about. Um, so I, I put these slides together for you to think about how to do the engagement pieces that you're going to need for potentially if you decide to go for it before your research award or um, some other kind of award. Um, that you know, and I okay. can you, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm um, loud. Oh, can they hear? Uh, okay, all right, here we go. Um, so the, the first thing is, uh, with regards to to engagement, is that this is a sort of a continuum of engagement, and it talks about. The different ways in which you can engage and, and it's really about thinking about how you share power right and so you can involve stakeholders and patient partners from the very beginning through focus groups town halls but you can also go all the way to sharing governance in a study and so you you are uh, you know creating a study where you have a patient who is a co-investigator um, they're being paid uh, as part of the budget of the grant um, or whatever other funding mechanism. And um, there have specific tasks that are related to leading patients and uh, leading patient-related matters throughout the study. And so you can also have an advisory committee or some other kind of executive team. But it's about getting you to think about the governance of the study and also getting you to think about how you share power, um, not only in terms of decision making and governance of the study, but also the financial part of the study. Engagement of patient uh, stakeholders can be seen in all these different areas in the top bar. Um, primarily, I, I wanted to highlight these uh, in terms of the identification of the topic, which we already talked about, thinking about the aims and the question, thinking about how you, what are you, the things that you're going to compare in your study. So if you're thinking about comparative effectiveness study, what are the two interventions or three or four or whatever it is that you're going to compare? Um, and then thinking about the outcomes. What is your primary outcome, your secondary outcome, and how uh, you're going to measure those? And so the other areas where your stakeholders and your patient partners can contribute is in your research design and thinking about the, the methods that you're going to use, how you're going to randomize, um, and also other criteria uh, that you may want in terms of your exclusion or inclusion of, of uh, subjects. And then finally, in terms of data collection, when and how you're going to collect data, your patient partners can be critical in helping you assessing windows of data collection and anything like that. Um, helping you think about the measures. When are you, what kind of measures and what kinds of questions you're going to ask. And also whether you need to reorder items or think about other ways in which you're going to collect data using technology or, or other kinds of things. So before the end 2014 developed what is called the engagement rubric. And the engagement rubric tells you, walks you sort of through the different stages um, of the study. So planning, conducting the study, and the dissemination. 
Um, at the base of the rubric, there is these principles um, of patient center outcomes research that we really focus on. So it's it's that reciprocal relationship, that bi-directional um, relationship where you're not only getting data and information from your patients and your stakeholders, but you're also given something back, right? Um, Co-learning, partnerships, and then transparency, honesty, and trust. This rubric is on our website, and it's actually a, a six, seven page document, which you can um, download and take a look at and, and sort of learn about. Um, I wanted to bring up this particular example because I think it answers some of the things that we started to talk about in terms of how do we transition from an engagement award to a research award? And so thinking about, okay, so we have um, this particular example where Dr. Smith, she created this breast cancer, uh, bladder cancer, sorry, uh, survey, patient survey network. And with the help of the participants and the stakeholders, they develop patient empowerment and uh, in engagement research program. And what they wanted to do was create, similar to what an HFA has created up to this point, an agenda, a develop, development of research questions and thinking about how you, what are the topics that are most important to, to patients with, with this condition. And so from there, they were able to transition into um, a pragmatic clinical study. And so the CORI funds, what are PCS studies, pragmatic uh, clinical studies that are researcher initiated questions. And there are other funding mechanisms, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, but um, in terms of pragmatic study, they want, they're looking for questions that are driven by patients. They're looking for collaborations. They're looking for opportunities to bring people together um, around a, a specific topic. And so when we think about that, the reason why this particular project was successful was because it had a champion. And I think that is one of the critical points I want to make here that Dr. Smith sort of created a team and that team led the, the eventual application of, um, for the award. So what, as you think about how do you transition from what you have now to uh, the next stage, think about who the champions can be for this work and who is going to you know, to have the ability and capacity to take on some leadership so that you can then move to the next stage. So these are funding opportunities. Um, they're on our website. You can take a look. One of the main things that is coming up, there's a pre-announcement for um, an award that's going to be opening up in January, and it's called the Partner um, Award. The main uh, difference from this award from other ones that we've had in the past is that this is a community driven award. And so what Pagori is looking for is to actually have a shared uh, partnership where there is an actual relationship already established, developed, and proven to be successful between the researchers and a community based organization. And so, you know, you're potentially in an ideal position to apply for something like this because um, it has that relationship has already been established and the work of this engagement award has already been done. Obviously, I have nothing to do with merit review, that was full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I make no funding decisions. Uh, but I think, you know, I would encourage you to, to go to the website um, and, and really look at the funding opportunities that are there. There's also um, placer awards, which are phase large awards in comparative effectiveness research. These are these can be up to $30 million awards. I have a portfolio of studies that have that much money, so I know it is possible. Um, so, but the questions obviously need to be very well established, well defined, and, and we need to have that comparative effectiveness research focus. So when I heard, I think it was Dr. Moyer earlier talking about all these combinations of therapies, um, that's, for example, something that, that could be a before study, looking at different therapies, how they, they work. The next thing I'm gonna say is get 
thinking about how you're going to put together a program fit calls. Think about who has the, the questions, the team, you know, how do you come together and think about scheduling a call with a program officer. So obviously you have to get ready to do that. That's not, you know, something you will do lightly and it will probably fall to the researchers and clinicians in the room to sort of think about that aspect of it. Um, but think about scheduling that call. And I was at another conference recently and this, it was a funders conference, all organizations that give out funding. And one of the things that kept coming up is that people just submit applications, but they never actually do program fit calls. They never actually talk to the staff at the foundation or at the organization to make sure that, that it's a fit before you put all that work and effort into an application. So when you start thinking about this, this piece of it, Schedule a program fed call. I cannot stress it enough. <laughs> Schedule the program fed call. Uh, and if you have questions, there's a Corey email. You can also email me, and I'm happy to put you in touch with whoever. Um, again, this is not my side. I'm in the engagement side, but um, happy to, to connect with you. I also want to say, um, NIH recently released a common fund um, funding opportunity that is actually looking to fund community-based organizations. And uh, I'm happy to, to send out the announcement as well, uh, but this just came out, I think it was maybe four weeks, three to four weeks ago. And uh, that is a little bit different from how we are approaching it at the quarry, but because we're not necessarily requiring that it can be a community-based organization, but NIH is requiring that. And uh, they are actually uh, moving moving faster than even we are at the point in some ways. So if you are not familiar with that funding opportunity, uh, then you know I'm happy to, to disseminate that. Uh, in terms of other ways, so to engage with the board, I put this here because some of you um, now be ready to do an application at this point, maybe thinking about ways in which you want to learn more about who we are and what we do and what we fund. And these are great ways to do that. So we have an ambassadors program. We actually have a patient engagement advisory panel. So for those of you who are patients in the room, um, this is a great way to get involved with Corey and learn about our work. Um, the ambassador program is as well. And if you're interested in being a merit review, um, merit review program, you know that's also available. We also have multiple stakeholder meetings and events. And we just had our annual meeting. The slides are up and the videos are up and everything. So you're welcome to browse through our website and find that. If you can't find something, email me. <laughs> um, okay. The last thing is our research portfolio is on our website. You can search um, on there for all of our projects. If you want ideas, of how to structure something. If you're thinking about uh, projects and you want to learn more about a particular methodology or something like that, feel free to you know search here and look around and, and grab you know information. This is my contact information. It's going to be um, these are other uh, engagement and uh, resources that we have on our website. There's an engagement resources page. And you'll find all these different guidance that we provide on equity and inclusion, how to build teams, how to uh, collect data with patients and stakeholders, how to look at representativeness in your research governance, and also a value proposition playbook that, that is really directed at engaging stakeholders in healthcare. So if you are thinking about a multi-center study and you need to bring in uh, you know, specific individuals within a healthcare organization, this is uh, something that might be a good resource. And then this is just some literature on engagement if you're inclined to, to read it on a Saturday night. <laughs> um, all right. Um, thank you.
So I introduced myself earlier. I'm Mark Skinner. I, I have, I wear, and I've worn many hats within the community. I'm here today really talking about uh, patient centered research. But of course, to shout out and kudos to MFA. When I gave a talk at FISNA a few weeks ago, I was asked to sort of reprise and talk about my experience in the years I served on the Corey Rare Disease Advisory <laughs> Board and sort of the grant process. And so I did my, my homework, I did my research, the one of the three human play grants funded by Picori, all with HFA. Loads of loads of thalassemia and you know, sickle cell and thrombosis and all of our sister diseases that our centers work on. But the really is sort of you know, a pretty big zero. I mean, these are great grants, but they're still small dollar grants relative to what Picori has the potential to do. So love to the last talk, eager to see where this goes. Um, uh, so as I said, I which one of these is my the clickers and the stuff where you want to get that into the like the button. Um, so my complex, I do a lot of research uh, now, and uh, it's uh, been fun to sort of across the uh, the board. So I just wanted to uh, do this little graphic because our journey on patient-centered outcome research really is quite long in hemophilia. I, I've been involved in a lot of it, but really starting back with the IOM study which identified patient centricity as a core for the future of quality health. Um, Mike Porter and a public economist did some work identifying patient reported outcomes, telling us we need to think beyond those things that you can count in the clinical setting to those things that really matter to those of us that live with the disease. How do we function in life? So that what does it mean? How does it interfere in our life? Um, that was about the same time that Corey was uh, originally um, funded um, and founded in 2010. And, and that was when I was involved in Picori uh, in the first uh, Rare Disease Advisory Committee. There was a wake up call in 2011 in Sweden. They did the first health technology assessment on hemophilia therapies. And we went, uh oh, we don't have all of the evidence in data we need, particularly if you want to understand sort of the societal impact and the things that matter to patients. So we started doing some work. Uh, and this also happened to coincide about when the FDA did their patient focused drug development initially, um, and uh, hemophilia on low brain disease were one of the first ones. In fact, we were the first one with NC, the Center for Biologics, uh, uh, the first disease group to go through. So that was published with a lot of community input. Uh, I had just completed my tenure as president of the World Federation. And so what I was really interested in is not are people dead or alive and how many joint wounds are you having, but what does it really mean in your day-to-day -day life to live with the disease? So as a group of patients, we developed a, and have now um, fully content and, uh, uh, and uh, all of these sort of the FDA requirements validated the new PRO looking at health outcomes in the field. And that's part of what I wanted to show you today. And that data now is being used in, um, in the ICER technology assessment reviews, one's going on right now as we speak uh, on gene therapy uh, and hemophilia uh, and, um, and being incorporated. And I mentioned the international piece before. So the World Eating Disorder Registry, which is an international registry that's being set up at hemophilia. And quite a bit of standard um, standardization work has been done. So there's been a long line of work helping us understand the outcomes that are important the things that have value and sort of how to organize the data in a, in a way that we can present it to regulators, payers, governments, other authorities that are making decisions about our life to make sure that there's patient centricity uh, in all of that. And the newest tool that we had coming forward, we completed the content validation, you'll see it on an exploratory basis very soon, um, is a, a new mental health outlook PRO. So how is my mental health outlook today versus sort of after I have um, uh, have therapy, whether it's gene therapy or another novel therapy. And so uh, that is going to be incorporated in the, uh, in the international registries and in probe. And, uh, and I think a half of this plan will be incorporated as well as a number of pharma studies going forward. So, um, so you probably have a sense that it takes a lot of data to assess value and really understand what we mean. If it's not patient centered and if it's not on the outcomes that matter to me as an individual living with the disease, um, then how's it going to make a difference in my life? I don't sit around with my buddies probably any more than, than you do. How many bleeds did you have last week or last month? I talk about the same things. You know, did you go to the sporting games? You know, did you play with your kids? You know, all of the stuff that you want. And so is your hemophilia or your bleeding disorder getting in the way with that? So having the right outcomes becomes important. And so our goal has been as we were developing the, the, the the probe study is could we create and curate a set of data and outcomes that could really serve as a possible lifespan 
from the early clinical research, from we just have a basic sort of idea sitting in the lab. I want to develop a therapy to do X. What are the outcomes that will affect for an individual? How can that data be used sort of at the second stage in the market access therapies coming to market? How do we tell payers, regulators, the FDA that this matters to me as a patient and what a data we have? And then in my last box, sort of the real world applications that share decision making when you sit down with your doctor and try to have a conversation. Um, treatment regimen A versus B, treatment product A versus B. Of course, all of this assumes that, you know, that, that the women are getting to those clinics, but uh, but we need data to, to understand that. And so that's so the, so the program initially was designed to really move beyond, and, and I who knows, it's hard to stand up and give a personal story, but I think there's been a couple amazing stories today. But it's the personal story gets us so far. And you can say that story of my experience in my PD class or you know, any other kind of experience is the story of hundreds and thousands of other people. You magnify that qualitative story of one and are able to quantify the qualitative experience. And so that's part of what all the research that we're talking about really is designed to do. And so how can we tell our story of one as a story of a community and be able to back it up with rigor? Uh, and so uh, that's inherently a research agenda. So I, I, I worked with a group of colleagues to publish uh, a research paper a couple of years ago. You can't read the title, but it's achieving the unimaginable um, in, in defining expectations uh, in hemophilia. And what we really wanted to do was to set a patient speak about patient outcomes and clinical outcomes together, because doctors and patients think differently, uh, and we each have our jobs, but we've got to come up with a common vocabulary so we understand that, and, and this is part of the beauty of recording, you know, it requires uh, everybody to sit down together, but we've got to be able to think together. So as you think about sort of the ability to enhance, which is sort of the arrow across the bottom, and then the life stages, you know, these are the stages which I went through sort of early on, some with that still aren't getting full treatment, maybe doing that today. You know, my life when I was born, I was born before cryo was discovered, um, and so survival was my goal. Um, and moving on, so progressively improving the quality of life. And what are the metrics to do that? Where you know my docs are thinking about, you know, let's present prevent chronic joint disease. You know, I want to be able to play and function uh, with my other kids. So we try to marry those up, uh, and that's really sort of like the early stage. The next stage really is part of the part where I think we're living in the U.S. now, at least for um, severe hemophilia is um, we're getting closer to a normal life, but it's not quite normal. Uh, we're able to do most of the things we want, but we still are restricted, um, uh, particularly around trauma and breakthrough bleeding events. And then of course, uh, we have to finish with that, you know, uh, utopian uh, view that we all desire to be cured. And someday we'd like to live, not have to live with it or think about it. And we're not there yet, but gene therapy was just approved in Europe for hemophilia. Uh, a, uh, and I, I did make a note earlier, women were not excluded from the EMA approval for hemophilia A in Europe, just to take note. Um, they, they went beyond what the clinical trial population was and actually discussed it some in their authorization. We don't know what the FDA will do um, because it's been filed, but people are thinking about it. So, um, so our goal really is to achieve health equity between populations as well as with the leading disorders population against the general public. We often think of health equity, you know, in the sense of sort of uh, disparate, marginalized, or other populations, and those have been historically untreated. But also, I think we need to think of those as a class, the group of people that live with a leading disorder versus the general population. What can I do that my peers can do? As well as you know, what can I do that maybe my sister that also that hemophilia could do. So there are a whole range of PROs out there. I don't have time, or um, uh, you know, that is, do we need to cover all of these today? But as you're thinking about outcomes, it's it's not a all of them are fit for a particular purpose. So you've got to pick what you want to measure and understand which instrument. So these are a range of instruments that can be disease specific. Uh, or they can be generic, which allow you to compare to a general population, which matter differently for what you're using. Payers understand one, regulators understand another one, a different one may speak to me. And so getting the right instrument to measure the right thing uh, is fundamentally important. So what, what I am going to share with you is the probe study, which I am the principal investigator on with the group of colleagues. Um, <clears throat> 
This is, uh, we've been uh, around for 10 years now. We spent the first two years validating. We're in over 100 countries. We now, it says 45 or soon be 51 languages. So uh, widely content validated uh, around the world. Uh, it's been taken um, uh, close to 9,000 times now and, and widely being used. And so these are really sort of the, uh, the overview of the domains that we talk about. And they relate to things like, what's my ability to go to school, get an education, get a job, go out, have a family, and do the social things that everybody else does? And how does my hemophilia interfere with that? And our goal has been not just to do it in hemophilia, but we're collecting public controls so we can benchmark against the general population so we understand what that decrement is between a woman that has mild hemophilia and a woman in the general population. So when you're making an argument to a peer, you want to cover this. It's like there really is something going on here. You know, uh, mild hemophilia is not benign. You know that from the evidence. So um, I, I don't like to talk to docs. Um, I talk um, up that, you know, it's what matters to me only. It really is, it's both. It's not clinical outcomes versus patient outcomes. We need the combination of the two. So on the left are the things I just described, the metrics that we collect uh, within probe, uh, and then on the right are those things that are typically collected within a healthcare setting. And that one, you know, that, that one percent of your life that you spend sitting in a doctor's room, you know, uh, is the right side of the screen. The ninety-nine percent of your life is on you know, the left side of the screen. What you do day to day, and we need to marry those um, for different purposes, and, and, they, and they're used to interpret each other. So I, I said we're up to 9,000. My, my colleague who runs our dashboard, she's actually in Russia visiting her family and her internet access, as you might expect, is somewhat limited. So she wasn't able to update this table for me, but I did look. We are very close to 9,000 now. This was uh, data that was presented at the World Federation Congress. Um, I also looked, and we now have so about 25% of our data is uh, our women. We now have over 1,900 women in, uh, that have taken the survey, and uh, about 1,000 of those uh, have hemophilia or are carriers, and uh, the others are, are healthy controls. So uh, we're developing a, a pretty wide diversity. The interesting thing about mild and moderate disease, because it's typically not treated prophylactically, uh, we have a lot better ability to aggregate data and pool data around the world because the experiences are similar. You know, again, my sort of interest in international peace earlier. So this was the very first paper we published, and I had an interest in this topic um, because of sort of the arrival and the advent of gene therapy, that non-severe hemophilia is not benign. And I was curious if after gene therapy I'd become mild. You know, is my life really like somebody who's born mild? And how close are we getting to closing those gaps? But the same thing works. So this was the first time you can't see it, but the table on the right actually is the female data that we published out. So it's the first time we've actually published uh, all of our data on females. And, and I'll drill into it a little bit. But if you just read the abstract, it basically says that 53% of males and 29% of females with mild condition reported they had two or three bleeds in the past 12 months. So we do collect bleed data. So that's not insignificant. And maybe the bleeding patterns are different, but at least in this cohort, it demonstrates that bleeding is having a significant impact. I'll talk about pain, but we collect information on activities of daily living and maybe put up on the screen. 15% of uh, women in the general population reported they had difficulty with our uh, activities of daily living list. 29% of women with mild hemophilia reported it. So, I mean, again, we can tell the story that it matters. Um, so, particularly for our advocacy, this data becomes really helpful. And so we can drill down on a whole lot of variables. We also collect EQ5B, which is a generic public health instrument. So we can benchmark against other surveys uh, as well. And those are some, uh, and then we create composite scores uh, across the board. So this was what we did to compare um, um, on team. So just looking at, uh, on the left are the males, on the right are the females. We did not have enough moderate um, females to, uh, to score, but so in the oh, right, um, uh, are the no bleeding disorders, the blue or mild, and the purple are the moderates. And so you can see, obviously, uh, acute pain and chronic pain, impact of activities daily living, and requirement for mobility aids, which could be anything from compression bandages to orthotics and issues to um, a wheelchair, 
um, goes up. But we're seeing you know, similar um, uh, differentials, uh, maybe not to the same magnitude, but we, we see them uh, on the, in the women as well, which again, it's important to, to have this kind of data that to make the educational case as well as the advocacy case. So as I already said, uh, the, World, the World Federation of Hemophilia is doing a world leading disorder registry. They now have over 10,000 individuals that are being followed longitudinally. And Probe is the PRO of choice that they've included now in uh, collecting our data globally. Uh, and, and similarly within the World Gene Therapy Registry, we are hoping to launch uh, in the first half of the year uh, an initiative that might well parallel what you're doing here, but a data collection project targeted on mild and moderate hemophilia, non-severe hemophilia. This is a specific interest in the large group of women uh, collected within that, so we can compare uh, the, the data globally. So it'd be awesome if you wanted to do something in this respect and you can marry and match and compare uh, US and, uh, and European data along with the rest of the world. So with that, I will stop. I have given you a very rapid teaser of PRO research and my project. There are others out there, but you know, we would love the opportunity to collaborate or talk about it before. And my contact information can reach out. So we're going to like, oh, okay, we're gonna get started again. Um, pick that momentum back up. Yeah. So I, I think they move the panel up front this time um, so that it's just less running around with the uh, microphone and that will we'll, we'll pick it up better. So, so Jill and Jill and, and, and are on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> moved to the front of the room. <laughs> We're no longer the naughty children in the back. Okay. So, and and Sky, um, we did have Michelle Ray who was gonna come and facilitate today. She is joining us virtually. So, hi Michelle, thank you for being here. But Sky graciously stepped in to help facilitate um this discussion. So, I will let you kind of roll, but we're we're just looking to you know really brainstorm some ideas and next steps and and how we can work together and form some case on the I think people can hear if we're speaking. Okay, so, so I guess we'll reserve the microphone for the audience for you all out there. So I'm hoping that this is like a game of I don't know kickball something where oh. we just start kicking the ball around and everybody kicks this ball what is me better now <laughs> some sort of uh tag no walking tag um the goal here really is to culminate all of this time and energy into high level next step and an agreement right that we can all work together towards those next steps, whatever we agree for those to be. Um, and keeping in mind that we want them to be patient-focused primarily for all of the people who have wear multiple hats here. Um, so with that, uh, we have this lovely panel. Um, and Candace, you're sitting right next to me. <laughs> so I'm going to just start off with saying what if you were going to put one thing on the board right now is what you would like to see come from this work, what would it be? I would say a detailed map of next steps. So to your point about money, we were having a conversation in the back about, well, what does this look like? Like, where do we go to find the money? So me being somebody who's always bugging everybody on Capitol Hill about for various things, my first thought was, why don't we go back to Congress? I mean, we're coming up um, to an election in a couple weeks, but then we're, we can hit the ground running uh, early next year. And so my first thought is, well, appropriations time. This document, every time I go to Capitol Hill for various groups and advocacy groups and I help out and lend my voice and expertise on the Hill, the one thing that my friends always tell me is like, well, I need something concrete for my boss. Or a member of Congress says, well, if I go sit in a committee meeting where I talk to other people, I need something to give them. This document right here that we worked on and that we refined, that we talked about and that we've iterated over and over is that document to say, well, hey, 
we have researchers, they're interested in this. They helped us create it. They're excited about it, but we need to fund it. And you can't ask us as patients to do the heavy lifting. I can't do a bake sale and fund the research. I'm sorry. There's not enough t-shirts that I could sell to do that. So with that, we need it. We need it, you know, we need this money. And so I think one big thing from the patient perspective too is like, as much as I'd like to think that I know about how you go about getting your funding sources, I'm ignorant to it because I've never done it myself. So I'd say like, first, first thing I'd like to do is like, let's get something together where we start talking about, well, where are your most common sources of funding? What can we do to support grants or funding research, letters of support? Um, you know, where are you located? So let's figure out who your representatives are. You know, obviously senators and members of Congress, you know, like let's talk about you know doing between all the the leading disorder organizations having that coalition of support on the hill you know opening our rolodexes and figuring out who we know who we have good relationships with and working from there because at the end of the day as much as I love all the ideas we have until they have the money to execute on these programs we're kind of just sitting here and we're and we're spinning. So if we could get the money and we can lay the foundation and let's say perhaps for you guys, you could say, well, priority wise, in my experience, here's what um, I, here's what I've written or here's what I focused on and I've won and I've differentiated myself or, you know, um, your, your educational institution, like they're interested in that too. So the priorities align, let's figure it out. Let's knock it out and then go from there. And then we can go through this document step-by-step step and check it off. And then, you know, between HFA, NHF, like everybody's working together uh, just to kind of make that happen. Funding is a big one. Detail that next step. Find the money. Find the money. <laughs> okay. okay. Gina, what are, you, what are you feeling? Well, to move away from implementation a little bit, um, in reading this for the first time today and kind of thinking about other ideas that have crossed my mind in clinic, one of the things that seems really relevant in this population where symptoms don't always correlate well with actual, you know, levels and numbers and anything very easily measurable, certainly in the laboratory setting. Um, recognizing that like quality of life and disease impact are gonna be way more important outcomes to measure in this population than they are in the biological males. And that's like a huge redirection, I think, and reframing of how we look at hemophilia, um, research in this population. And right now there are lots of different scales out there to measure quality of life and menstrual bleeding impact, but there really aren't any that are widely accepted as like the gold standard in this population. And so maybe it's like one priority of something that is going to weave its way through a lot of these projects. Um, it kind of similar to like identifying like what definitions are we going to use um, is figuring out like what are we going to use as our definition for like quality of life and disease impact? Is this a scale that already exists? Is it one that we need to adapt to this population? And kind of just identifying what those key outcomes are that we can measure to not only know how things are impacted um, on the patients, but then also to be able to measure our success with an implementation. Are these things that seem like they're the most important to actually getting better over time or once we implement some, some new change? And obviously that comes really strongly back to patient engagement, just because patients are going to be the ones who tell us, you know, what are the major ways that these diseases are impacting their day-to-day -day life. Um, so I don't know that that's like a really like a, a very specific uh, action item per se, but I think in the context of this whole thing, going to be something that's going to be really important. Right. And it's Jenna. Jenna, yeah. That's Sorry. <laughs> I spent like the first 30 seconds like thinking, I said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it easy. It's confusing. Don't worry. Uh, Jill, would you like to add to what would be your? Sure. At first, I want to boost both of those. Absolutely essential. And if we don't know who has a bleeding disorder, like getting to this whole point, like we need tools for that. The diagnostic thing, diagnostics in the lab are also never going to get better because we don't know who we're missing. So yes, all of that. Um, I kind of want to know who. I want to know who's up for this. Where are the allies in the different silos so that we can rally together, like the people who have the energy and the open-mindedness and the understanding to get stuff moving in the beginning. Like, because 
we can't start everywhere all at once. So where are the people who are up for this in the different stakeholder groups so that we can start working together? So I did a kind of like a who, who is it? And where, who what are they, what are they on the for? team? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also have a team. Mark Skinner <laughs> mentioned a champion. Um, and that might be something that who's the who's the champion, who's the team lead? Uh, if we could identify that, that would be really first step in some way. Yeah, and you're not volunteering, Jill? I would love to be here, <laughs> but I can't do it alone. <laughs> and I also just learned about all this, and I feel very much like, wow, what an amazing thing. And I feel like, oh, if we didn't And maybe know. it was my, my, so. my the, the, I'm sorry, you said champion. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it should be, we want to build an army, right? Like, well, we've got to get it. Yeah. Who is it? Who's it going to be? <laughs> Um, we had, Trisha was also supposed to be on this panel. She is um, on Zoom. And I wanted, I didn't know if she wanted to add in. I'm Trisha. Hi, I'm is. here. I don't know if you can see me, hear me, hopefully. <laughs> the bottom of your face. <laughs> oh no, the bottom of my face. I don't know why it's just the bottom of my face. I'm looking right <laughs> at the camera. Maybe I should there turn my, go. oh, you got it, is that better? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, I mean, I would, I, I echo um, Jetta, Dr. Moyer's comments, you know, wholeheartedly, you know, we know the definition of heavy menstrual bleeding is based on the impact on a woman's quality of life. And the last couple of studies we've actually done, neither one of the studies, both the, the levonorgestrel IUD and OCPs and trinexamic acid, um, did the hemoglobins actually change significantly, but the women's reported quality of life and their ability to do activities and not be bleeding as much or changing pads as much was remarkable. It was across, it was pretty impressive. So having that tool, I think is a really important piece of this specifically as we're addressing, you know, those with a uterus bleeding. Um, I think that's pretty critical. Um, and then, you know, I think all of us are all in, you know, <laughs> my, bit crazy busy world, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't think I certainly can't be that leader. I think, you know, many of us are a little bit hesitant, nor do I have the power to, to um, make things happen. Uh, so I, I have a hard time. I'm a little hesitant to answer that question, but I think we all obviously are very engaged and want to see this forward. Great. Um, is there anybody else on Zoom that wanted to speak while we're in the Zoom sphere? Anybody else raise their hand? No. Okay. Well, feel free to, if you do want to speak um, in this part of the conversation, just raise your hand on Zoom. We have folks that are keeping an eye on that. Um, so, hands on the chat if you want to just type. Yes, or if you want to just type in on the chat, <coughs> great. Okay. Um, well, I then move it over to the rest of the folks in the room. I see a hand over here. <laughs> Carrie wants to speak. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to build on what Jill just said. And as the director of an organization that does not do research because we don't want to compete with all of the individuals who need to secure grants for that, we do support research and platforms for that um, and offer research grants. But I would like to see, if possible, a map or some type of document that shows us what other organizations like organizations are working on in the, these areas. What projects are they undertaking? And then kind of a, a spoken wheel type of image for me would be, well, you're working on that. So maybe you could work on addressing X, Y, and Z. And for us, we have our clinics and we have, um, you know, implementation things we can work on, provider education, pathway implementation, because I think once we map out what research opportunities are happening, but then also where we can all kind of fit in, um, I think we could address a lot of this together 
I don't know. I just feel like we we're all you know we're competing for the money. Um, we're competing for the bodies. We're we're having to pool our research um, to create the databases, and I just feel like we could do this together um, a little bit better. And I also think it's an encouraging way for junior and new faculty to see a career path. Um, and that they could make a career path in this um, area, which we know we need new professionals um, and we need to develop that. So I would love to work with whomever on trying to identify what's happening now and what the interests are of other organizations because we need to have that conversation and it's, it's time. So. <laughs> So Carrie, is the would the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders be interested in working on some type of global assessment? Or, yeah, yeah, it'd be global. It doesn't have to be United States. We have a staff of, of two full time and part time and half. We're all women, so we can do that. Nobody's that. We just do it. But yeah, yeah, we'd be happy to help. I don't know. I mean, yeah, whatever that is, I would be happy to help. A following comment, real quick. I don't, I, the owl does it, right? Okay. Do you talk loud? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, I am really interested in what it means to be the community. And, and the rooms I'm in where this is the conversation are almost entirely female. At the state of the science, some of the most compelling voices were not female. They were the relatives of affected female. And I think that's an important voice to also consider engaging um, because they resonate in a way that sometimes we don't. <laughs> and all the voices are important. So one of the most striking ones was a, a father of, who had hemophilia B spoke on behalf of his daughter who was being ignored and he just chastised us that we were not including females in the research discussion. And it was super fair. And he was one of the most effective speakers <laughs> in the whole thing. So I think diversity in this, in this way too, that caregivers or other relatives might also be a part of the who um, that we haven't, I haven't seen as much of. <laughs> Reaching out to those people and asking them to get involved. Yeah. That sounds like, okay. Mm -hmm. so it's Michelle right. right oh okay hello can you guys hear me yeah okay so I just wanted to follow up on on you know a comment that was you know has been made a couple times here which is you know how we can collaborate to um you know move this agenda forward and and I apologize, I, I missed the last speaker's name, but um, really in the idea of, you know, kind of gathering information on what is, what is being done right now um, that includes women. What are some of the, you know, studies that may be going on? What are some of the, uh, you know, even kind of some of the pre-work that's being done looking at, at women with bleeding disorders and trying to, you know, looking at our industry partners too, what, you, you know, that have studies that are, you know, either upcoming studies or studies that ex exist now, where are we in including women in those studies? And I think the point is to try to have that list and then really look at as, as a group collectively, okay, what are the, you know, one to three things that we want to try to move forward with and actually sit down as a group to write a, or, or, or identify certain people within the group that can do this, that can sit down and kind of write up a proposal again, as what was talked about earlier, there is funding available through ICER. If we but you have to go to them with a plan. You have to speak with a program officer. We have to at least have an idea instead of 
that, that's a little bit more specific rather mm -hmm. than just kind of, we, we know we want to move forward on all of these things. If we could choose a few things that we could do that. I agree that everybody's competing right now. And what ends up happening when we compete is that we end up having sometimes duplicative um, efforts going on at the same time, which really, I think there is enough money there to do the research if we're strategic and how we approach it. And there's enough money then for it to go around to everyone. The problem is when there's multiple people working on the same things, also asking for the same dollars, what happens is I don't think anybody gets to fully do their research the way they want to. And it kind of actually slows the research instead of being able to move something forward. It would be great to see two or three you know, big steps for the community, for, for women. And then look, women are happy to get out there and, and fight and advocate. You know, they do that for their kids right now. We just have to encourage them to do it more for themselves. I think as moms, I can say this, I have two kids with severe hemophilia. I also have mild hemophilia. I am much more aggressive in fighting for what my kids need than in fighting for what I need. And so I think if they really saw that we were, you know, that we've heard them and are moving forward in, in you know, some areas, I think we would find lots of, of um, champions for us out there to, to move forward in the future. But I think it really is about first finding out that list of what is out there, what are people working on, if there's already something in um, you know, going on, let's say, you know, one of our partners is, is doing um, some research, you know, we can also ask, is there, is there extra help you need? Is there something that we could be adding to that to help you get further in your research? So again, I just think there, there, there are some avenues open to us or available to us to try to get some funding, but I think we need to have something pretty clearly defined and be aware of what else is out there and, and, you know, where is the most strategic way to utilize those funds? Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I think Maria was gonna say something next. Yeah, thanks, Michelle, we miss you. Um, so, so a little bit late for because it was part of the last conversation but we ran out of time so we've mentioned a couple of times the sos the state of the science and that was a process that began a few years ago um and it was it was an effort to get the community together to think of research priorities very very similar to what you guys have done and by the way great 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 job amazing thank you for having me um and so so we our our vision was a little bit more global but one of the working groups was for women, recognizing that we didn't want to dilute the expertise because you know some of them were, you know, we had hemophilia, we had AIDS, we had the Willebrand, we had disorders, we had rare disorders. But understanding that we didn't want to dilute the expertise in women, we created our own, you know, one of the working groups also women. And like um, Mark said, I agree. Maybe I mean not surprisingly, right? Number one, we recognize the huge gap. In, in knowledge that exists. We recognize, number two, that women want to be included, they want to be a part of the discussion, they want to be sitting at the table, they just want to give them the opportunity. And number three, many of the, the um, priorities that you guys identify definitely overlap with ours, right? And that's, of course, not, not surprising. So my comment to that is it would be good, I agree with Mark, mapping out, you know, the similarities on, you know, on what was identified by, by both organizations and then perhaps look at feasibility, you know, what are the tools that are at our, at our reach, what is it, where can we start, because like Jill said, there's so much that, you know, that, that anything that we do is, is worth it. And so maybe finding, finding what are those, you know, what, what, number one, also, you know, understanding who's doing what and what efforts are ongoing, and then look at pieces. The, the next part of the SOS is now developing a national research paper, and again, recognizing the expertise of the patients, that, that experience, that lived experience, and that perspective that is so unique and so important. 
as we as we look at the way that we conduct research in the eating disorders community, we are fully aware that one of the main pillars to conducting that research has to be the, the influence of that patient voice in all, like Mandel said, in all stages of, of research, right? So now our challenge is, okay, every working group has its own, um, its own task, but how do we embed that patient perspective? How do we embed that patient in all that process? And in what stages is applicable? And what do we need? To, to make sure that the patients are incorporated in that. What, what are the tools that they need? What's the education, the support that they need to make sure that they are prepared to do that in a meaningful way where they feel, you know, this. So continuing on that is, you know, like you said, there's a lot of us in this room that are doing similar work, or at least our missions are very similar. Our interests are very similar. Our willingness to make changes happen is very similar, right? And so how do we leverage each other's um, strengths and how do we collaborate to make sure so that we are not recreating um, the wheel? So for example, just like you guys, we have grants. You know, what if we unite ourselves and you know our organizations and we create grants that are perhaps a little bit more than what we that we get. Each of us independently can do. Or we say, you know, you obviously your grants probably focus more on women, but maybe in itself, one of the grants that we gave next year will be focus on women. We can, you know, We'll, we'll ask for letters of intent for women, for example. That's another um, opportunity. And other opportunities are, are registry. We have a community voices in, res in research. It's a registry of patient registry, but also collect patient reported outcomes like Mark was explaining earlier. You know, we have a couple hundred women in there. We can leverage, you know, we can leverage not only the system that we've created, but also develop, you know, we have a way of reaching a lot, a large volume of women and understanding mental health issues, understanding symptomatology, understanding um, access to care issues, right? We have socioeconomic information, we have diagnosis information. So it's it's about recognizing what everybody else is doing and then leveraging what, what we can offer so that we can collaboratively then reach this milestone way quicker than, than we, we would do by working by ourselves. So that sounds amazing to me. One of the things I'm left with, and I'm going to let everyone else see, is just who is, who's taking the lead on something like that? Like, I, there's a lot of really amazing people in the room and different organizations, but we definitely need someone, some or a group collaborative, I guess. I would think HFA, since they're the ones that brought us together, they take the lead on it. And I would be happy to, um, you know, I, yeah, I would be happy to. I'm excited. <laughs> to, I don't want the energy and the work that we've done to end here. Um, however, the reality is, I, I would, you know, I need support. Um, so I, I would love to work for free, but I don't. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, it takes again back to the funding. But I, I'm happy to get things started. Um, and hope that the support would follow. Um, and I would, Maria, I would love to, you know, partner with you and Terry. I think you know, we could, could probably meet again and and get the ball rolling. And yeah, I mean, I I would be happy to to, to start things. Um, Can we put a table for the funding? <laughs> okay, we yeah we. <laughs> that would be that would be <laughs> okay. so I will piggyback, I guess, on what everybody else was saying in terms of you know, sort of assessing and cataloging kind of all what's happening, because I do feel like we, we do have projects and many of us represented here, but we do have um, data on women with bleeding disorders um, on some of these topics that are in the research agenda. But so we can start with sort of low hanging fruit of what is currently available, but then thinking, you know, especially with other limited resources, thinking, okay, we can with additional funding, we can prioritize some of this other work that maybe is not currently being studied or captured. So that way we can kind of have, you know, different concurrent paths. So sort of the low hanging fruit, what do we currently have now? What can we leverage 
that's already available and existing, and then you know what is still left to be done, whether it's you know clinical trials or other you know comparative effectiveness research that needs to move forward. Um, I think for us, I know people see us as funders, and we do fund some things, but we you know we haven't you know we don't have additional money yet. Um, I was just looking at my email, recalling something um, a colleague sent me about in the current Senate language, which is not yet law um, for CDC. There is some language around women and encouraging um, CDC to ensure that the HTCs are expanding their data collection efforts to include women in the community counts program. So again, this is not law yet. This is in the Senate FY23 um, committee, but sort of things like that are good because they bring visibility and, you know, we hope maybe it gets to that point. And so having that congressional language also, um, now will it come with money? I don't know. Sometimes it just comes with the, the language changes or, you know, we get new language that have different areas of emphasis, but we don't necessarily, in many years, we haven't gotten the dollars, you know, additional dollars to support that. And, you know, I have to say in our division, we, we have, over the years done a lot of work in this area, but even still, if there was no new money, you know, there's an additional emphasis, like we still only have so many people, but, you know, as far as how we prioritize work within the division, you know, that helps to, you know, dictate, you know, how we um, divide work and priorities and activities. So that's something I think that's positive, but again, you, with this type of language, you, you know, don't always know where it's gonna go, but I think just having that level of visibility clearly Others in the community have been advocating for this, and so for when it's bubbling to the surface in this committee language, that's that's very encouraging. So um, something to look out for. And if people could just say your name, just for the folks that are on Zoom, as you start to speak, that would be helpful. Hi, um, Peter Chad from Sonoma. So I, I think this is a great discussion. But I, I think the the problem is, and to be frank, is that you know, unless you guys come together and step up with various capabilities, then what what exactly are we funding? Right? I mean, I don't think anyone's willing to fund NHF's uh, HFA's research capabilities from scratch, right? So I think to echo everything everyone said, we just had a conversation with renewables research with NHF. We have constantly running with Abbott in terms of data collection. I think, I think all the stakeholders are going to really step up and say, what can we do with our capabilities to further this story together? Instead of building something from scratch, is HFA really the champion here? Does that make sense? Or are they community organizers here? See, this, this, so we have funds for the offices, uh, companies who can fund things. But the appetite to fund, and I think someone said this, right? It, it, it could be diluted. If we get a ton of different grants and people funding, it's a piece of the education that women do this work with no real momentum moving forward. And I think what's missing here is also the unmet need. And yes, I understand that unmet need is data gap in women. I get that. that that's fine. But what does that result in? Right? Underappreciated women? Absolutely fine. But is it access to therapy? Is it payment? Is it diagnostic? What is it that is lacking here and, and that we are trying to solve for? Right, because it can't be a soft thing. It, it, and, and not just not not trying to downplay it. I'm not saying it's soft, right? But you, you have all these stories are going through. But let's you guys say demonstrate, like, you know, 50% uh, of women have joint pains or you know, things that require therapy but are denied therapy, right? Those kind of hard numbers really drive us. And as an industry, you know, we to be quite frank, we are in it to find potentials for high drugs to find an access for. So if you bring that to me and say, this is a huge untapped market potential, we just need to do the research. We'll be going to to fund that and our clinical trials to aim toward that population if we can get that voice together. But if it's if it's sort of, I'm, I'm seeing this break off here. There's a lot of things that are research interest, but won't drive us to form clinical trials in. For instance, metabolizing at 835, right? Good to have. But what does that mean in terms of like patient outcomes and you know the awareness? So I just try to focus a bit discussion to like think about if we're writing research grant, what is that on that we have to try to solve for?
So in our, I'll say like in our community-based research network discussions, there were sort of two buckets, right? Like there's the one bucket of like, what would pharma be interested in for commercial development? And like, as a, as a, my professional life, a strategic consultant for pharmaceutical manufacturers to get their drugs to market. Like I understood that there were some research priorities that would be of interest because there could be a treatment, there could be a biomarker, there could be something. But at the same time, there's just this like everyday and I'll use, just use the term low level, just in terms of what we were looking at, quality of life, day-to-day -day standard of care focus for research that was absolutely missing. So we were having a conversation on the break about like, I'm sitting back here and listening to what's going on, listening to what the clinician researchers are saying, thinking about all of the available therapies. And there, it's almost like uh, the, the advancement from pharma pharmaceuticals outpaced the research and just the ground level natural history understanding of women. And so we're kind of in a, in a weird juxtaposition of, of playing catch up because as much as we wanna have those treatments that are addressing joint bleeds, chronic pain, issues you know, with menopause, issues with childbirth, prophylactic treatment, at the same time too, if we walk into a physician's office and we tell them about our inherited bleeding disorder, we look like, they look at us like we have three heads. And so having that foundation of, hey, how do I get diagnosed? Uh, what does it mean when I have this and I reach a certain age or I, or I go through puberty or something happens to me? I think it's both. And so to your point, there's gonna be, I think there's, there's kind of two buckets. There's the quality of life, standard of care, diagnostic, treatment in a clinic, research that needs to go on. And then there's the other side of the research, which is going to be the, hey, how can we improve access to treatments? How can we talk about maybe those gene therapies that are in development that are for men? What do we need to do to figure out if they're there for women? And so perhaps what it is is that we need to look at the ideas where it's like, okay, so what type of research can we knock out for, for diagnostics, for quality of care, for, for just the baseline natural history understanding of women with different bleeding disorders? And then what are our industry partners looking at? Where, what are your knowledge gaps? What are your data gaps? I keep hearing people mentioning different registries, different data sets, different things. Obviously, there's um, you know there's hospitals and facilities outside of HTCs that are gathering data. I know that like you know all the different data streams from IDNs are a mess if you can even get them. So we have to sit down and think about this. So I think there is like there is like a two bucket approach to this. And as patients, we'd be curious to hear what are the blind spots that industry see because this is a conversation we don't really have. And so I think in that respect, like it's good to hear that feedback too. Because if we're going to sit here and, and talk about who's the leader, who's in charge, I think it's more of this collaborative environment where we sit down and we start knocking this out and saying, okay, in this bucket, let's talk to you guys. Like, what do you guys need day to day? What are you struggling with? What are the data pieces that are missing? What do you have in your registry right now that could address those issues? What other data sources we have? And then, hey, industry partners, what do you guys think? Like, what do you have? What about your treatments? What about gene therapy? And then we have to talk about like, and what about the FDA? And then for the CDC, like if, if I knew that there was language sitting in the Senate right now, when I had lunch with a congressman this earlier this week, I would have brought it up to him. And I would have said, hey, but I have no way of, of knowing. So we want to know what the CDC does too. And I want to know if there's money attached to that. Because if you guys are going to be asked to collect data and it's data that can help you guys potentially or data that can help you and our industry partners, then we need to figure out how to make sure that's funded. So I think that's kind of like in my mind, I, I'm putting it in, in two separate buckets, but it's where we're all in the same room and our priorities may be different based on our business goals or our, you know, just the ideas of where we see it going and what we can execute on, what we can bring to the table. But I absolutely think that, you know, just in turn, and, and, and it's going to be everybody's voices equal in this because everybody's priorities are going to eventually contribute to, to the success of what we outlined in that document. That was great. Putting it that way, seriously. <laughs> you did. Snaps the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, all that also. So that's like at the great point, right? Like everybody is a, who's a stakeholder has an ROI need for what they're going to get out of participating in something like this. And it's good to be transparent about what that need is. So the other thing is, every bucket is using different language to talk about what are the needs and what's important to them. 
And I bring that up because I look at this document and I'm translating already. I can see we have an under treatment problem, which is a market, right? You don't know the size of the market. So, but they're not using those words, but those words can be translated. And it's kind of not necessarily their job to do that translation. It's our job to help them translate it into words that can then translate further to the next stakeholder. We need our Rosetta Stone to talk about all this stuff, <laughs> to be able to understand each other, because I do think this document is actually exactly great. It's just if someone went and put it into industry buzzwords, which are totally there, you would have a very great case for prophylaxis and heavy menstrual bleeding. What are we doing for prophylaxis and postpartum hemorrhage? Is that an untapped market? Yes, we're hearing nobody's getting treated or whatever. Um, as far as who needs it, if we're gonna walk the walk that we listen to the community, then I do think organizations like FHFA are the right place and we need to equip them with the language that is that can not make them sound like outsiders if they're gonna come to industry. You know, we need to help them translate what this is into why would your company or one of the other companies be interested to engage in a female market. So that's my two cents is the leader doesn't have to go it alone. We need to help them like we, as allies for something that we all believe is important and you must believe it's important because you're here. So like, how do we help them translate? And also mm -hmm. you can't do everything at once. The successes will help bring more success. There are limited resources to do everything. And it's just in rare disorders, there's a limited number of people who can participate, but it's also, at risk for a zero sum fallacy where only one thing can go forward and it will take away from something else. We need to find a way that we don't have a zero sum fallacy and compete out other good ideas. We need to find a way that we recognize more success will bring more success. So it's worth investing because it's a community that can get stuff done, enroll in the studies, answer good questions, give back to the community, and have it do it transparently will bring more, more and more to say this is a community worth investing in, is my opinion. So, but we all need to help you. But I do think if we're gonna say the patients are leading the way, then who am I to say <laughs> me or someone else is in charge, but we definitely need pilot projects that show can work that are discreet. So, yeah. And this is a little bit of a departure, but it kind of goes back to some of the things that were brought up earlier about kind of like how to tackle all of this. It's all right now feeling very like kind of confusing and overwhelming of like where to start and how to make sure there aren't redundancies. I mean, I think that's a big one, especially in a world where we're competing for funding, like say making sure two people aren't doing the same thing, but kind of different at the same time. Like that is a really huge re uh, waste of like cognitive and professional and financial resources. I don't know what is going to happen to this document. It sounds like there isn't a plan for it yet, but one potential idea or like a starting point of how maybe this can stay organized is if this gets published on a website or something like that, have there be an ability for investigators who are latching on to a project to indicate maybe like a brief synopsis or a title with a like the contact information for the PI. So that other people who are interested in a similar topic can then maybe have someone to reach out to for collaborative efforts. And if there's a funding source attached to it, like say, I'm imagining some sort of a website where there's like this whole graph and then two extra columns with the project and a PI and then a funding source. So that if somebody's coming in to like, look at this website and investigate different projects that they wanna embark upon, seeing what, like who has funded different projects in the past, or let's say who the investigators are out there who are are interested in one or the other of these projects might be a way for all of this wonderful work that's been done to not just kind of get like lost until next year when this meeting happens again or if it happens again or like whenever the next time this group convenes like having a way of I guess following it following it through and keeping track of things um yeah I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to do that. That was just something that kind of popped in my head as one potential approach. I just love the idea. I think that that's the answer to the problem. It would be amazing, amazing. Even if the you know, HFA could have that website with all the, uh, the areas that need to be researched, 
and then the organizations that can fund, uh, provide funding uh, will uh, you know, choose the areas that they consider to be the most important. And the doctors then decide what areas uh, are they interested in, in researching. And about the pharmaceutical company, let me tell you this. I just have this feeling in my heart that this is the beginning of something new. That this is like when men were beginning to get together and say, we are bleeding, we need help. And they were here and look how medicine has advanced and the treatments they are receiving, it's unbelievable, you know? From when my uncles passed away very young and then my brother lasted a little longer and my son living a full life because he has access to good medication and medical care. And so I think that for the pharmaceutical companies, this is the beginning of something big. I mean, this is going to be interesting. What is going to happen if new products are going to be researched for women or if the pro, uh, products that are already in the market are going to in some way be available for women and are going to really make a difference in our quality of life. So, so we'll see what happens in the near future, but I think it will be very interesting to see what happens. I have a question about the industry perspective. So whoever wants to talk on it should. I think it's important for us to understand why, and having many years of talking, why has it been hard to engage interest in what to me has always looked like an untapped market where you're looking to expand and you have a whole category that's easily identified by their biological sex as being at risk who we know need some treatment. But I, I've always heard, well, it's because they're intermittent and we're looking for the people who are on long-term trophy, that's the big market or whatever with a long time. Or if, especially when just like selfishly, like early engagement in families with which product they pick usually dictates who the rest of the family is gonna, you know, like it just, I didn't understand why it was been hard to engage in this way. So um, comments there would be, great because we wouldn't want to do those same things again. We want to have a different path. Yeah, so everything starts with sort of a, a, a assessment on market potential, right? So everything starts there. Obviously, hemophilia is a very straightforward market potential. It could be talking about being research, for instance. Yeah, I've also looked at branding along with vaccines, for instance. Where, and, and our labels don't preclude, they're not limited to men, right? So, and in fact, one of our recent studies, we actually did it for the female with severe, all of that, severe human DNA. Um, and endpoints are obviously designed to measure the fastest imperative efficacy, right? So we look at, I, I, I hesitate to say this, I, I know. I say severe phenotype is like really things, right? The most obvious phenotype measure those things. Like obviously, metamorph is a very severe manifestation. Like I'm a liver, I, I know. Like it's also very difficult to measure, you know, the amount of DNA and things like that, which is which, you know, you want to measure you know, one blood pads, things like that. Um, so fastest path to regulatory approval obviously dictates a lot of it. Now, I'm very transparent here, right? I'm, I'm, yep. You know, this is, I think we need to be transparent, right? That's just that very very people. Our studies have not prevented women from enrolling if they need that initial deal, right? Um, our therapies are not mm -hmm. limited to men. And so this is where I, we need to understand why the physicians are not writing the therapies for those patients. Because there's nothing in our label that necessarily prevents them from writing for Women. If you guys, as a physician community, come to us and say, we lack the data to want to do this, that's that that does speak volumes. And if you come to us and say, we need this level of data mm -hmm. in order to untap this market for you guys, yep. then we would listen. But there's no clear signal here. What, what we hear is we invest a lot, as many of you guys know, into educational research. To educate people on women in the industry. We fund yep. hundreds of thousands of dollars to seminars, whatever it may be, right? Yeah. Because we're still hearing that physicians, and we've heard that at lunch today, it's not the therapy label that prevents treatment, it's the physician mindset that prevents treatment. So what is the tap potential here? 
right? And so we're not going to do a phase three clinical trial, which is a hundred million dollars worth of therapies, and potentially slow recruiting population, unless we know the potential, right? And going back to the previous thing, I don't this. I think the first step, honestly, in this whole research thing, like just respectfully again, is for every group to just evaluate in their capabilities what are they going to do to propel this forward. I think Apple needs to sit down and say, we are the database leader in this in this whole community. How can we build a research module that blows out this woman's previous story before you go on their website? Because if you do that, and I've worked with this before, if you build a registry and collect the data and then open up to researchers with curiosity questions and say, we are providing this platform with data that you guys can mine to answer these questions, that's a very different question. If you have a hundred researchers say, hey, I'm interested in answering this question, but I have no data platform. I'm going to tap my temporary spaces. My, no, that's not going to move forward. You need to provide a research platform. You need to identify people who can do some retrospective data. You need to find claims data experts as well, because my answer to those questions, you guys need to talk to Athens about clinical data. You guys need to partner with NHF and HFA and get that community voices. You know, what does that patient database look like? And that that's how you start this discussion, right? It doesn't start from one curious physician saying, hey, let me see what I can do. Okay. Right? It starts from infrastructure. And that, you know, that's what we really need to go with. Does that answer your question, Jill? No. no? <laughs> 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 but it gave me a lot of things to think about. I want to just share an experience I had trying to start a von Willebrand's and pregnancy study, which is now going. But it, it started 20, 12, 2013, we were building basic science data on the changes in the Wilburn factor. And, you know, 2015, we have the James Vidal paper, which was supported by industry, but investigator in your state study, fantastic, showing that women are undertreated, not reading the targets you thought, and they're having more bleeding. So the data is there. And we have organized as a community to say, these women are being undertreated. We want to run a study where we're targeting higher BWF levels for longer for postpartum hemorrhage prophylaxis. No manufacturer of a von Willebrand factor drug would talk to us for years. When was that? When Starting was that? 2012, and we got funding in 2018 committed, and we started in 2019. So during those periods, and I don't know, I just don't know how else to say, like, and we weren't even looking to change the label. We were just going to say, like, you know, <laughs> Because we didn't have a big regulatory burden, um, and and so it was it was it was really to say like you know we just want to we want to we want to fund this. Of course, there's a lot of other ways to go about it. Um, it was written up and put through study section at NIH. It's not going to go. Um, and we did we are we are going now with the support of an industry partner, but it took a number of years. And during that time, as a prescriber, I can tell you I am getting denial after denial every time I want to write a drug. And you're it's easy to just give up. So I think there's a lot of barriers to prescribers too, because they're missing the data to go get over that appeal, which still takes time to say, I know she's undertreated. I think she needs factor. I don't think 50 is the right target or any number of things. And it was, it was sort of to me, it was a it was a it was, I haven't done the heavy menstrual bleeding walk, I've done the postpartum hemorrhage walk, but it, you know, the map the as the data mounted. We're really under treating them, which should translate to someone selling more drug <laughs> um, to people who are doing a pretty common event in the country and a pretty common disorder as far as their rare disorder goes. It wasn't gaining the traction even after we had the data. Um, and it wasn't just me, like we had a, quite a few of us, you know, stomping around trying to get a study going. So I think it's multifactorial and each time how the reason things don't go forward. And it would be good to have better understand. And how to not how to not do these same things again. So it's just an example. I want to add to what you said. Um, at HFA, when I was there, we did uh, a survey with Novartis on barriers for access to care for women, and we specifically surveyed uh, doctors. And the barriers are insurance. The barriers are not having enough information um, and understanding exactly how to prescribe. And they're not necessarily um, related to not wanting to take care of their patients or not thinking that their back concerns are valid or that there is not a problem. There, there is a great understanding 
but they is a lack of education of the providers. And that is a, a barrier that if pharma wanted to address, they could because the evidence is there. And part of it is because your labeling claims are not necessarily focused on what women need. And so you can't educate on a on a labeling claim that is not there. And so you need the research to show and support the labeling claim and, and modify your labeling. Sorry, I'm not an advocate anymore, but I <laughs> But I think what's interesting is like what you said and what I said are both true. Like they found like very different barriers to accomplishing research, and uh, they're both true. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. speak on behalf of CFL and I'm assuming that CSL and and the time potentially, right? But I can't speak on behalf. I went to four different companies. Well, the Von Willebrand treatment is sort of the Von Willebrand company. So you can right. guess. Oh, yeah. and, and actually, when I was there, I funded we funded quite a, a few studies with Margaret Ragan and Margaret Lockett. So we are listening. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, again, I can't speak on behalf of their strategy and their funding at the time. But the funding is there and it's on strategy. There's no reason why it's the funding. Well, I think I think it's complicated, right? But it's always complicated with questions, right? But it would be good to talk about like what that kind of language is what these guys need to be armed with. I think hundred percent. I think the, the key key takeaway here is that we need to be more transparent as pharma and what we are interested in. Yeah. Right. If we provide buckets. And they're and even they frustrate me. <laughs> yeah. Pharma, right? They frustrate me. They're too general. Mm -hmm. I don't think and it hurts relationships when we say, oh, we're interested in this and we end up not funding. Like, right. Well, mm -hmm. you know, so and and, and to very specific to my study, CSL had funded the study that provided the data for the next follow-on study. And it was we were just not prepared for that not to be the thing that they wanted to do at the time. But strategic stuff changes about which drug in the portfolio is going to be the thing you've got your emphasis on or whatever. And that's another reason to point for the need for diverse funding mechanisms, because companies are going to get acquired or changed, or their their things are going to change. NIH projects end. You know, there's no infinite thing, but stability would would help us a lot. That these projects aren't starting and stopping, and everything is built just comes to a halt, and then someone has to build new again. So if there's if there's a way to save that, I'm almost afraid to say that. I'm Part of industry. Um, oh no! <laughs> that was not the intention. We're all in it together. I'd like to say I'm very thankful to the people that are funding our VIP study now. Yeah. You know, like in person. I mean, I wonder if it's possible, possible to just break this down a little bit, just because when it is super complicated and it is kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? How do you get something accessible to patients if patients aren't coming to trials and not being diagnosed and not being presented for treatment? Etc. So I, I wonder, there's already so much good information captured. I wonder if it's an exercise to just to sort of do some feasibility impact mapping so that you can begin to sort of prioritize the things mm -hmm. that are feasible today and high impact and the things that are high impact maybe down the line that you could lay the groundwork for. Like much of these things around um, understanding the unmet need finding the right PRO, getting it validated and all of that, like that isn't gonna come overnight. From an industry perspective, if it's a new product, if it's if it's in development, right? Like there's a lot that has to happen before we can get something, like before we can get a product in front of a patient, right? Like we have to navigate regulators, we have to have trial designs and endpoints that they will accept so that it can be considered, right, for, for safety and efficacy. And then once you have the data, you need to make it so that it makes sense for the population decision makers to be able to want to even put it on the formulary and then you get into access issues. So I think some of these things are not necessarily in our control. And as they stand today, probably don't serve women and girls very well. But I think there are opportunities for women and girls to participate in studies where women and girls are not excluded, knowing that it's an imperfect world and data collection won't be super specific. You know, we we um, recently presented a primary analysis on a study of ours in mild moderate hemophilia, age, which is and and we 
had structured the study in a way such that we had extended out the enrollment window as long as possible to recruit women and girls. And, and girls. And so we ended up with like three patients, which sounded so anemic, right? Um, but it was three out of four patients approached, which to us underscores the interest of women in participating in these studies. So it, I, I feel as though like all great journeys start with the first step. <laughs> we just want to take some steps towards what we have, understanding that the road isn't perfect. Um, and I think we should sort of have some way of having some sort of ongoing dialogue over time. So that, that's really what I want to say. That was fantastic. Mm -hmm. As a provider, almost everything I do is off-label because there's nothing on the people. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I also, yeah, you know, it's, um, in the off label fight is tough when you get that insurance yeah. denial, because I went through that and it was like, my physician didn't know what to do. He also doesn't have the time to sit on the phone and argue with the insurance company. It's so much time. It is so, so much time. time. <laughs> like designing hubs for pharmaceutical manufacturers, like one of the worst things is like, when I asked him, like, so do you expect like PA process? Oh yes. And then it was like, okay, so like. How, how many, you know, how many steps do you want to support for a second round? What do you do? But then it's like, when it comes to off label, there's no support. So then it falls on the patient. And the challenge is like, yeah, if you're dealing with, you know, post pregnancy hemorrhaging, the patient's not getting on the phone screaming at an insurance company, like, and, and then time is of the essence. And so how, you know, how do you buy that time? And I think, you know, what you're using off label uh, you know, for your patients is critical. I think as patients, you know, we want to hear what that is too. All of it. Um, and then like, I'm always in conversations <laughs> with, um, with people on Capitol Hill because I use Rituxan off-label about like how lucky it was. But when I went to use it a second time, the doctor whose father discovered ITP wouldn't give me Rituxan. And I had to go find another doctor. And even as an attorney, and even as somebody who is as loud mouth and full in a China shop as I was, like, I, it was to the wire before they put me in the ICU to get that drug. And so it's like, we've got to think about like, okay, so what are those, what are those medications? How can we talk about getting the, that data and having that data set there? Because the insurance company asked me like, well, well, do you have any data? No, I don't. But it's also like, um, this is, a, <laughs> this is a drug administered in a hospital and like, I can't call up hospitals and be like, hey, got anybody that I was has ITP with the toxin that you could give me their, their medical records and I could send them? What do you do? So I think this is part of a broader conversation as well in a bucket is what does that look like? And then mm -hmm. can we, you know, can we figure out like who else in clinic is using this? And then what do we need to do? And then I had mentioned to Whitney before, like an FDA listening session. You know, like, what do we do with the, obviously the FDA is very familiar with any sort of metrics around men with eating disorders, but I work with a lot of rare disease groups that do patient-focused drug development meetings and FDA listening sessions. But of course, these are, or these are diseases that need a natural history study. There's a couple hundred patients, you know, worldwide, and maybe they're looking at a gene therapy or something. Um, but we're kind of working backwards. So it's like, well, what about an FDA listening session? What if we could get together and talk to them and say, look, here's our concerns. Here's what we have. Here's, here's some folks that are like treating patients in clinic in these very serious and grave states having to use off-label therapies. What do we need to do? Like, let's work together. Or maybe it goes to a PFDB. And maybe it's that conversation of, you know, here's the, this is the data. This is what we're looking at. Here's the questions from industry of like, hey, here's our knowledge gaps. Or here's, if we're approaching you about a trial for women with this, you're asking for this and you just don't have it and going from there. One of the challenging things is the reproductive capability question, right? And so trying to, I mean, show me all the drugs that have labeled indications in pregnancy, just not even this, right? Like, yeah. like, <laughs> or is it okay to breastfeed on fill in everything you know? <laughs> so it's a fair, it's, a, it's an interesting and challenging problem that is not my expertise because I'm really elaborate. <laughs> but it, it, you know, as a physician, we run into it all the time, and we do the best we can. I have a physician colleague who's an insurance approval, so maybe we need that too. I learned I have so many fewer denials now that I'm friends with her because I know <laughs> not because she's approving my things, guys. She's a pediatric something else, 
but because I understood now what was the rule that was like, I got to see behind the curtain and they need two peer reviewed articles and, and a guideline or something like that, that says you need to use it. And, and so I, I was, I was like, all right, I'm going to start writing my own articles. <laughs> That's <amazing. laughs> we and are going, going to have to wrap up. up. No, this is, um, we've come to the end of the day and mm -hmm. Janet is going to wrap us up finally, but, um, I just want to highlight a few things that I heard, those action items that we tried to start out with. Um, one was we are going to do some sort of assessment, a list of what people are doing. I heard that HFA and Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders are going to connect on that. Um, so we can at least get a sense of who's doing what in, in this sphere. Um, but I also heard from Maria that maybe we need to do this mapping from the state of the science to this research agenda and even look at some sort of feasibility piece. Um, I don't know who's going to take the lead on that, but those two. She's looking at me. I don't know. Or or <laughs> but then I think that the first one is easy because it's basically everybody in the room just make a list of tools or or activities that you think we could leverage to an effort such as this and send it to us or to Janet. <laughs> and it, and then you compile a list and then you and then you get back on a call, you're like, okay, this is this or or, or you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you have a list and then you can start you can start that conversation that is as easy as that. And then I also heard Vanessa say, you know, there is we do have registry data, we have data on women. We should we can look at that, we could do something um, to try to start to get at that. What's the problem? How do we take next steps? Um, so Vanessa and I can keep talking about that from an admin and, and we have data too. And then the community voices right. and research. So, and and this, all these tools are community tools. I mean, the CDC is a community tool. And each of this is our registry, but it's the data. I mean, we invite people to come and, and you know, help us look through it, keep it, you know, so. It's about leveraging what we already have. Yeah, it's a good start. Absolutely. So those were kind of the three big things that I heard amongst other really fantastic conversations. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Janice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, it's been a long day and exactly what I thought might happen did happen as we opened the Pandora's box. So, <laughs> um, no, no clear path but um, I think some really important conversations. Um, I've been doing this work, I mean, I started at HFA in 2011. We started, um, I started working with women probably in 2013. As you saw on my slides, this has been kind of the focus of my job for the last six years. Um, I'm absolutely committed to this effort, to these efforts. Um, so I'm happy to try to be the organizing body of this work. Um, so I, I guess I would say, if you're interested in continuing the conversation, um, you know, trying to move these efforts forward, reach out to me. Um, I think you all have my contact information because I invited you all to come. <laughs> <laughs> So Whitney or I reach out to us um, and, and we'll try to just, you know, work on some of these tasks and keep, keep things moving. Um, I think there's some really great momentum here and I, I just want to thank you all so much for, for taking the time to come in and um, getting through a long day. It's, it's really important work and I just appreciate you all and value you all so much for the work you're doing. And then we'll keep doing it. So. Um, lastly, if you wouldn't mind just scanning the QR code on the screen and just taking a really quick survey um, about the day and, and any additional thoughts you have or want to share with us, um, I would really appreciate that. Mm -hmm.